calling this hearing to order. For the record, my name is Kenzie Bach. I'm the city councilor for District 8 um, and also the chair of the Boston City Council's Committee on City Services and Innovation Technology. This public hearing is being recorded. It's being live streamed at boston.gov slash city-council-tv and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN and Channel 82, Fios Channel 964. Um, we'll be taking public testimony at the end of this hearing, so if you're here with us in the chamber, please sign up on the sheet uh, near the chamber entrance over there, um, if you haven't already. And if you want to testify virtually, please email Ron Cobb, um, that's R-O-N dot C-O-B-B at boston.gov um, for the link, and Ron will get you that virtual link and you can join us in a bit on, on Zoom. Um, for all testimony, we ask folks to state name and uh, neighborhood or affiliation and keep your comments to a couple of minutes just so we get everybody in. Um, Today's hearing is on two dockets. So it's docket 1328, order for a hearing to discuss trash containerization in Boston. Um, that was filed by myself, um, Councilor Louis Jen, who will be joining us in a moment, and um, Council President Ed Flynn. And then also docket 0467, order for a hearing to discuss pest control in the city of Boston, which was filed by Councilor Flynn with co-sponsors, um, Councilor Liz Braden of District 9 and Councilor Aaron Murphy at large. Um, so we actually had a hearing on the pest control um, docket earlier in the calendar year, and um, and then when when um, me and my co-sponsors filed the trash containerization one, we thought that since these issues remain very intertwined, although also distinctive um, in different ways, that we would combine the two and have them both here. So some of our folks in the administration are more prepared to speak to the one or the other, um, but we wanted to kind of be having one joined up conversation. Um, and, and we had also kind of talked when we had the rat one about getting back together before the end of the year. So, so that's what we're doing here today. Um, I, uh, I'm going to go in a moment to my colleagues just for a very brief opening statements. Um, I think I'll just try to piece together an order of arrival because um, basically everyone's a sponsor. Um, but uh, we're going to be joined today by our colleagues from ISD, represented by John Ulrich, the Assistant Commissioner for the Environmental Services Division, um, Dennis Roach um, from Public Works, their Assistant Superintendent of Waste Reduction, uh, Ter Teresa Savarese on his team, our Zero Waste Director at the City of Boston, um, and then we also have working on um, trash containerization strategies in particular, um, our Boston Housing Authority represented here by Joel Wool, their Chief of Staff. Um, so that's going to be our administration panel, which we'll go to in a minute. Um, and we've got lots of great folks signed up for public testimony as well. Um, so I'll go to my colleagues. Uh, who was first? Okay. Um, first of all, uh, Council President Flynn. Thank you, Madam Chair, for sharing this important discussion today. And thank you to my colleagues as well for their sponsorship of these, of these dockets. This is an issue that I probably focused more of my time and, and attention on than probably any issue over the last six years. And the reason, the reason for that is because it's a, it's a significant quality of life issue. It's a significant public health issue if you don't solve pest control in clean streets people will move out of the city. And I've done numerous walkthroughs and visits and tours of various neighbor neighborhoods throughout District 2 um, looking at ways to improve our pest control strategy. I also want to acknowledge the professional work that our city workers are doing on this issue from public works and ISD, John Ulrich and, and, and Dennis Roach and, and Teresa as well, Public Works and Joel. Um, but, but we need to do more and doing more also includes more resources and services, looking at what is working, what is not working. But I'm, I, I want to acknowledge the professional work that the panel has been doing, but also to say that we need to do more. I often look at what New York City is doing on pest control issues, and, and they're, they're doing incredible work. I do hope to visit New York City. Um, but if we, if we don't solve this issue or make improvements, um, again, people will move out of the city. 
there's nothing worse for a family to have a, 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 a rat running through their house when they have a little a little baby in the um, in the in the in the chair sleeping. Um, so these quality of life issues are critical. They're important. There's nothing more important for the residents. I, I, I also want to see if during the opening discussion if you could also highlight how many calls you've been receiving from um, 311 on these issues, on pest control issues. My colleague Michael Flaherty has also been involved in this issue. He often talks about the Norwegian rat. And, um, and he asked me to weigh in and let, let the panel know that, that this is a critical issue for him as well. Let's work together. Let's, let's make sure that we, during the budget process, we work together add more resources to public works, to inspectional services to address this critical issue. I want to thank my city council colleagues for their important work as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, Councilor Aaron Murphy. Sure. Thank you, Chair, and thank you all for being here. I know um, in my first year here on the council, it's, it is also probably one of the um, most talked about issue and I do believe that it's probably one of the most important quality of life issues even though most people don't always want to talk about it but we do um, and it is tied together so thank you for combining these two because we can talk about how do we contain the trash but also what do we do with it during the week I know we've had conversations about that and and I've shared my personal woes on my street near um, several apartment buildings where Maybe the trash isn't stored correctly, and then it's brought out in thin trash bags. So looking forward to this conversation and finding out you know, how, how can we do better to make sure that the city is not dealing with this issue in a way that, you know. And also, as an at-large counselor, it's not just, I know we refer sometimes to Alston or Brighton as like Rat City, and there are issues there. but. Oftentimes, at least once, twice a week, I see large dead rats on the sidewalk right in front of my house. So it's in every neighborhood, even if there's not construction going on. So it's definitely a citywide issue and happy to be part of this conversation and part of the solution to help make sure your departments have what you need to help the residents. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. Councilor Braden. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you all for being here this morning. Um, and thank you to my co other co-sponsors of this very important discussion. Um, well, I really feel we, we, this is a perennial conversation. I think we've, we've had multiple since I've been here this last three years. We've had this conversation on an annual basis. Uh, trash management is a major contributing factor to the rodent problems across our city. And it is a public health issue. Uh, I know uh, how hard staff in public works and ISD work, and the staff work, uh, but we never really seem to get ahead of this problem, so we have to try and strategize and think what we need to do differently. In District 9, we have a huge number of uh, large, large landlords and absentee landlords who just pay the fines and never spend the money to actually fix the problem. Um, and it's, for them, it's just, I think we've had this conversation the last time we had a hearing, it's just the cost of doing business and nothing changes. So as a city, uh, I feel that we really need ways to know who, who the bad actors are, who the owners are, um, and to hold them accountable for the proper storage and disposal of trash in, in our, in our neighbourhoods. Um, and I'm really wondering, uh, you know, when the big dig was happening way back when, they had a they had a master plan for how they would manage rodent control at that time, and they had a, a sophisticated interdepartmental structure that that seemed to work. Um, and we, it was written up. I think I've mentioned this before. We were a t we were a study. Uh, it was sort of the sort of center of excellence, the best way to do it. Um, and I think we really need to go back and look at that and see. Are we doing that still, or is there still a problem? We need the, to use the all the technology at our disposal, such as GIS, etc., to track where the problems are and exercise our enforcement powers. I really wonder. The question I have that we'll be discussing this morning is like in our enforcement. Are we really using the full weight of our enforcement powers to try and tackle this problem? So I really look forward to the conversation this morning, and uh, hope that we can move this ball down the field a little. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you so much, Councillor Braden. Um, we've also been joined by uh, Gabriela Coletta, District 1 City Councillor. Councillor Coletta. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you uh, to the sponsors and for bringing this, uh, for bringing both of these dockets up for discussion. I want to thank the panelists for being here. Um, we've worked together on, uh, on many constituent cases over the last couple months and even before that as a staffer for the last city councilor. And I just want to um, be sure to thank BHA and Joel Wool for being here too. We've been working through some issues in Charlestown um, which have since then been revolved, um, resolved. But this is a perennial conversation as Councilor Braden noted, uh, especially for my high density downtown um, neighborhoods, especially the North End there is no room to store any trash containers. And so we have seen just trash um, all over our streets and it is hard to contain. It is hard to um, have any sort of enforcement, but I do want this to be a solutions oriented conversation, thinking about more resources, maybe more enforcement, thinking about um, nature-based solutions too. I think at one point the city of Boston, and this is just a rumor, but I, maybe the city of Boston had deployed skunks to um, help with the rat issue in East Boston. Any clarity on that would be great. And then also uh, talking about um, dry ice in, in terms of rats. But I do look forward to this conversation and, um, and just trying to find solutions at the end of the day so that our residents could have uh, a neighborhood that they're proud of. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Coletta. Um, for my part, I mainly want to echo my colleagues say that this is, I mean, it's a critical public health issue. It's like the most basic thing about city services. Like if, you know, the streets are overrun with rats as in some of our neighborhoods, they really are right now. Um, you know, we just, I think, you know, we, we don't pass go. When it comes to just all of the things that city government needs to do, this is like a really, really fundamental one. Um, and one of the reasons I think it's so important for city government to take a leadership role is because it isn't all about things that we can do. A big piece of it is a coordination challenge. Um, and that, that is usually the case for public health problems. And I think we all saw during COVID, like if the city of Boston had said, well, we can only deal with COVID-19 measures vis-a-vis -vis public facilities, like we would never have, you know, done all the critical life-saving things that we needed to do. So that was just, I mean, that's the most extreme recent example of where the private and the public world have to come together. And just um, just like, un unfortunately, um, you know, infection doesn't follow any of our arbitrary jurisdictional lines, um, neither do rats. Um, and so one of the things that, like, uh, I'm very interested in a couple of aspects of this problem. Um, one of them is that, like Councillor um, Coletta, I represent several neighborhoods of the city where there is really, like, no room for traditional large trash barrels that are used in other parts. Um, there's nowhere both to put them out on the sidewalk nor to store them inside of people's homes. Um, and so because of that, we use plastic bags. Um, but as folks know, those get chewed through. They get chewed through especially because we have a practice of allowing folks to put trash out starting at 5 p.m. the night before. Um, there's been a lot of conversation about the timing of trash pickup and you know the fact that we moved that hour back from, from 7 to 6 a.m., um, which just means more people put it out the night before. But then we've also seen increasingly trucks coming later in the day, um, which then means that you know we can get close to a full day that this trash is out on the street. Um, it's it's not rocket science. Like the longer it's out there, the more that it's providing um, sustenance. So I'm I'm very interested in everything we can do um, to tackle that problem. Which means like to me, it's you know. A shorter window that it's out. Are there ways that we can um, be more precise about that? Uh, are there ways that we can push it into the same sort of daylight day? Um, I think that I, I want to acknowledge as we start out, especially since the order that I filed is about containerization, that the city is actually doing a containerization pilot right now. It's our composting pilot. Um, and of course, that's, you know, we talk a lot about composting in terms of the environmental benefits. But we should acknowledge as well that compost is the stuff that the rats want in our trash. And so to the extent that we can solve you know, the problem at the composting level, great. Um, I also think that uh, you know, we do, though, have to also just be figuring out how we cross some of these jurisdictional lines with our plan, at least, even if people are responsible for different pieces. I think um, it's very frustrating when we have a situation where rats are sort of technically holed up 
on you know private property and they're running between and sort of it's not kind of it's outside of the city's jurisdiction from a baiting perspective but the experience of people of residents is that they're seeing rats run across our public streets um, and of course provide all the all the sanitation challenges that they do um, this is not the subject of this hearing but I just want to recognize that another thing that um, that I'm very concerned with as, as chair here and, and hope to take up um, in further partnership with Public Works in the new year is commercial trash and how that gets handled. We have just a whole lot of, um, uh, especially in our mixed use districts, um, what's happening right now is that somebody who lives with a alley in the back bay that backs onto commercial establishments could have four or five separate commercial trash trucks running through at night, often at crazy hours because they're trying to avoid the daytime and. Um, and that and that schedule is also creating situations where we have trash out for too long um, and in uh, unsecured ways. So I say all that to say that I'm aware this is a really multifaceted problem. I think that the fact that this, the fact that the residents of Boston experienced it having gotten worse in the pandemic, um, is bad. It's also a reminder that like nothing about this problem has to be treated as inevitable. Like it can be better and it can be worse depending on the actions that we collectively take as a community. Um, and so I'm really grateful to have the hardworking city folks here today because of all that you guys do already on this problem. And because like, you know, you, you are both leaders in what the city of Boston needs to do and also in helping us think about what all the people in our community need to do about this. But for me, um, I, I'm interested, I just, I don't think that the like thin plastic bags out for 24 hours, the status quo in many of the neighborhoods I represent like is a workable solution. So that's why, the, that's why containerization's in the title. I'm well aware that there are lots of challenges with containers and reasons we haven't been there. Also, it probably there are parts of the district where trash ends up piled on a particular corner and it would make a lot of sense to have containers there. That might not make sense, you know, in places where it's more distributed, but I, I um, as the chair of this committee, really want to make sure that we're kind of like firing on all cylinders with new solutions here. So that's the aim of this hearing. Um, I want to go to our uh, members of the panel for opening statements, and then we'll jump into questions and, and get to public testimony um, in after that. So uh, I'll go first to John Ulrich, um, who, as I mentioned, is our assistant commissioner of the Environmental Services Division for ISD. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the Council. Uh, John Ulrich, I'm the Assistant Commissioner of Environmental Services at Boston Inspectional Services. We are an enforcement division at ISD. Our main function is enforcing the state sanitary code to address the sanita sanitation issues that contribute to rodent activity. All of our inspectors are licensed applicators. Our division is responsible for pest management in public sewers, public ways, and public parks. Over the last couple of months, we have increased our night trapping, baiting, applied 500 pounds of dry ice, and increased our use of the Borough RX machine. We continue to look at our data to find ways to be more proactive and working to strengthen our communication and cooperation with other city departments. Rodents need food, water, and shelter to survive, but food is the main driver of rodent activity. Finding solutions to trash management and storage is the best way to reduce rodent activity in the city. I appreciate that Council's continued work on this issue, and I am ha happy to be part of this conversation. Great. Thank you, John. Um, and then Assistant Superintendent of Waste Reduction for Public Works, Dennis Roach. Yep, um, my name is Dennis Roach. I'm the Superintendent of Waste Reduction for the City of Boston Public Works. Um, we deal with mainly residential trash and recycling type programs. So everything you see in the street on residential trash pickup, um, single stream blue recycling pickup. Now we've added programs in food waste that was mentioned here in composting. Um, we do textile pickups uh, and we, we are about to embark on mattress recycling in the next calendar year. So uh, we do deal mostly on the residential side, although a lot of these things, these, these issues kind of commingle with each other between commercial and residential trash. Um, 
in, um, code enforcement actually reports to our division, and that's where we touch a little bit of the commercial side. So we enforce the violations for commercial code and, and, and things like that. So um, we've been really focused the last um, six months or so on educating um, people how important it is to containerize your trash. That's our, our main tool right now is education and pushing that message out there. Um, there is no regulation that you need to store your trash in a container on the sidewalk. And as Councilor uh, Coletter uh, alluded to, it's the most, the, the areas that have the most problem with containerization, it's the most challenging to containerize your trash due to storage issues of these containers and everything else. So, um, Council, you mentioned the, um, the food composting program. It is really the first almost pilot in containerization in, in the city, too. It's kind of had a side effect of that because you're taking um, what John alluded to is, is the food source being the most important for rats and you're putting it into a container. Um, so we're seeing some improvements there. It's very hard to quantify those, those improvements then. But we, we rolled this program out on July 1st. We have 10,000 residents um, registered. We have about 7,000 sitting on a waiting list for the next rollout period um, on, on, on July 1st. But um, that should be a very effective tool because you are taking the main food source out of the tra trash and putting it into these containers on the streets. So we're very excited about that program. We're very excited about um, even this hearing that's gonna kind of push this message out here about how important it is to put trash in containers when you can do it. Um, and we're also very excited to hear some maybe ideas on how um, in residence where you, you keep, don't have that option, if we can start hearing some ideas about what's, what, what we can do and, and what we should start focusing on uh, in the next fiscal year would be important for us. So thank you for having us here today. Great, thank you so much, Dennis, yes. And I know both myself and I believe Councillor Murphy are on the wait list for our compost bins. <laughs> um, so, uh, and um, Dennis is joined here today by Teresa Savarisi, as I mentioned, uh, the Zero Waste Director for the City of Boston. So, Teresa's here to answer questions as well. And then um, Joel Wool, on behalf of the Boston Housing Authority, um, we asked them to join us. Uh, obviously, the BHA has a big footprint across the city, um, and, uh, and they've been doing some work thinking about containerization and such at their sites recently as well. So, Joel, if you want to give an opening statement. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members of the Council. Um, thanks. I should actually start by thanking the um, Public Works and ISD team who are really uh, essential partners. Um, we have day-to-day -day and long-standing relationships with both of those departments um, and frequently collaborate on the um, urgent response matters or high-priority you know, constituent queries that your offices get. Uh, I'm mainly here just we have been thinking, you know, pretty hard about the city's zero waste goals and administrator Kate Bennett has really sent out a decree that um, you know reducing trash consumption and improving kind of the quality of life around the issues that, that are related to trash so keeping it in the bin right reducing the volume um, by by extension addressing um, pest issues that can result from uh, particularly food waste is, is a huge priority for the BHA. Um, it's something we want to do for residents um, and neighbors, but also, of course, for the uh, environment um, and the, the savings to all parties when we can, we can reduce um, what needs to get hauled. Um, so I have, I wanted to share just to, to give a general sense. Like we have properties you know, across the city. We have many different kinds of properties, but um, we basically at BHA sites have roughly four um, layouts uh, of how the trash containers uh, infrastructure works, right? That would be several, at the larger sites, you know, one or more um, dumpsters outside. At some of the sites, we would have a trash compactor there. In some sites, it's more of a, it's just a series of trash barrels and staff taken out. And in some cases, just a few. Um, we have a sort of more traditional residential curbside pickup. Um, because of that, we're really, you know, thinking about how do we design solutions that work for both, you know, townhouses off of Galvin Boulevard, right, but also um, high rises downtown or in Roxbury. Um, and we're at, at, along the way um, implementing solutions that are uh, in partnership with the city that, um, you know, as as we can. So one. I would say like successful thing that the BHA is just absolutely thrilled about would be the textile recycling um, uh, effort that the city is engaging in and we're really trying to get that going anywhere we can um, and it's I think tremendously helpful um, to, to us um, as well as to um, getting things out of the trash um, that don't need to be there. Um, in general we're looking at 
kind of three different areas, right? It's like, how do we decrease the volume, improve the design, and expand education? And we have been meeting internally with our staff, but also talking to extensively to Public Works about all those issues. Um, so I'm incredibly grateful, again, for their partnership. Um, and I just wanted to say, you know, on the day-to-day, -day, like, our, our property managers and maintenance staff are working all the time to make sure that these issues are addressed well. We benefit tremendously from having, um, you know, essentially residential pickup facilitated through the city's um, trash contract. And we, um, for other issues like construction debris um, and uh, yard waste, are, are also procuring hauling services ourselves and containers. Um, we are consistently dealing with issues of illegal dumping and things that frustrate pickup. So sometimes, you know, when the trash isn't being hauled from a BHA site, it's because something's in the bin that shouldn't be there, and that's because someone came in and put it there, right? And so it's not necessarily at fault of the BHA, it's not, uh, it's not, not, necess not a city or, or the city's contractor, it's, um, it's really intrusion, unfortunately, of um, I think unforgivable activities there. And that's something that we are continuing to try to work on partnerships to crack down on and that um, we do see as really um, people taking advantage of BHA residents uh, and communities. Um, um, so that's something we'll continue to look at. And part of that is you know tracking and enforcement, but also just having containers that are hard in areas that are harder to do that in. So this conversation of containerization you know, is certainly like, yes, having, having lids or fencing or other pieces or um, sizes or locations of containers that are smarter. We will be working with Public Works in some capacity to bring on consulting services to really think um, holistically about the portfolio. Um, and we've also just looked at um, the City of New York and NYCHA and some of the strategies that they've employed um, to see what would make sense um, for Boston or for portions of our portfolio. Um, and then just as a general note, we're not currently um, composting, and I think our thought around that is um, how can we, you know, we would like to roll it out with the pilots, our sites that are served by sort of um, residential pickup, which I think is Galvin and Fairmount. Um, we're, we're working with Public Works and thinking about how residents there may be able to participate in some of the current pilot efforts, but for other larger scale activities, we want to phase that in in a really thoughtful way that comes with these other, you know, intelligent use of the containers and um, pairing it with, with this, the, the integrated pest management strategies as well. So I think that I just wanted to sort of put all that up front and um, happy to answer questions as they arise. Great. Thank you so much, Joel. Um, yeah, we'll jump into council questions. Um, Councilor Flynn, if you want to go first. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to the panel again for the important work you're doing across the city. Let me, let me start by asking what, what are the numbers that you are receiving through 311? How, how big is the problem currently? How many calls are we receiving? We're certainly receiving a lot as city councilors, but I know 311 is also receiving a lot. What do your numbers look like? So for environmental services uh, for the year, we're about 8,500, but that is not just uh, rodent activity. Uh, so I don't have the numbers broken down. I can get those uh, for you, but uh, I know it's, it's average for what it's been the last couple of years. About 8,000 calls per, per, per year? Uh, 8,000 is the, the number of total, but uh, that is not just rodent complaints. Okay. Yeah, if you're able to provide me information on exactly how many calls or emails we're getting on. I can on... get you those numbers this afternoon. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, thank you, Joel, for highlighting the illegal dumping problem that we are have, having. It's happening in my district in Chinatown. Um, people like to use that neighborhood. I know it's not a BHA issue, but I'm glad you brought it up, that people like to use that neighborhood to dump their, their garbage in the neighborhood as if that's, that's acceptable. And, you know, wouldn't it be acceptable to dump it in, in, in West Roxbury, so why would it be acceptable to, to dump it in, in Chinatown? Um, I wasn't going to repeat the story um, about 
illegal dumping, but I'm going to since you brought it up, Joel. Um, I saw someone illegal dumping, this is a while back, and I got so frustrated and, and angry about it. I it was a construction guy and I chased him. He was in his car and I have bad feet, but I, I chased him. Um, it was near Tai Tung Village, going up Tyler Street and then onto Beach Street and then Harrison Avenue and then I, I had to stop. I got some of his license plate number, but I guess, I guess my point is for, for everyone when we see illegal dumping, you know, please take a, a picture of the license plate and send it into 311 if you don't want your name you, to be used. I know they don't use your name, but if you are concerned, please send it to me and I'll send it directly from me to 311. But I want to see, I want to see those fines increased for anyone illegal dump, dumping. I think it's, it's disgraceful to even do it because you're, you're impacting someone's quality of life and public, public health as well. Um, we have composting in, in my neighborhood on, on, in South Boston, and I, th I, think, it's going, I think it's going well. Um, so I, but I notice not many people do it. M my, my wife does it religiously on, thir on Thursdays. But the, the barrel that they provide, the small little container, you know, has a great way to close it so it's not, you can't open it. But why, why wouldn't other people be doing it as well? So this program was rolled out on July 1st and it was rolled out to 10,000 residents only. Um, and part of the reason is that is the infrastructure is not in place for these companies to come in and serve a city the size of Boston. So we're trying to grow the infrastructure up kind of with the, what the need is. So we already have, we have, we started 10,000 residents that the city funded on July 1st with the intention to add 10,000 every year okay. from here on out. But the, the, there, there actually is a huge demand for it. We have a wait list of 7,000 people. So the demand is there. Um, it, we're, we're trying to grow the infrastructure behind the scenes up that can serve the city of Boston. To, so, so we're in, in probably five years, our goal is around 70 to 100,000 residents and hopefully everybody that wants to food compost. And, 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 the, and the, the barrel is probably like a, a foot and a half tall, um, which I think is a perfect size. But is that, the, is that the standard size you're using? That's the only barrel that we're particularly using. Okay. Um, there are private home composting services that residents pay for that have different size barrels, usually smaller than that, little buckets and pails. Yep. Um, so th there are other options that you can do, but the city is using that standard barrel right now, yes, for the program. Okay. Um, two other points I wanted to make. I think Council Block um, stated it perfectly, but the timing of when people take their garbage out is critical. I think that's one part that we don't get down correctly is leaving our, leaving, our garbage, leaving our garbage on the street for a long period of time. Don't necessarily have the exact answer on how we solve it, but if someone puts their garbage out at seven o'clock at night and the garbage truck comes at seven o'clock in the morning, you know, that's a, that's a, that's, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. Um, so, I think we have to look at the times again. I know we've, we've, we've played around with the times and there's been some pushback from residents, there's been some concerns from the, the city, but why can't we get this issue right? Um, the, the times were changed, I think, going back three years um, where, we where we switched from a 7 a.m. start to a 6 a.m. start. Um, I don't think it's gotten the results the city has wanted. Um, we're certainly not um, thrilled with what's happened with, with, with what's going on in the street and trash coming out earlier. Um, we are under contract with the tr current trash company for another year and a half under those particular times. Um, but we are currently working on focus on a lot of issues around trash, but that being a main one, um, to re-change that and go back to um, dealing with it in, in, in putting those times back to where they were or even more structured times where we know we can keep trash out in the street, street a little bit less. Um, the city council and the, and the mayor recently approved um, a trash fellow for uh, public works that's going to take a real holistic look 
about how we write city trash contracts, how we pick up trash more efficiently, how we can get trash left on the sidewalk less, um, innovative waves that are ha happening around the, the country, the city. Um, we're gonna take a real holistic look about how we bid out trash in the city for the next time the contract is due, which is, um, it, it expires June 30th, 2024. So um, we're gonna take, it's for the next year and a half, we're gonna be focused on all of these issues I think, that we're talking about here today uh, through this trash fellow and how we improve trash out in the street. I was, last week I was at, an, a, at a town hall meeting specifically on this issue with Public Works, with the Chief of Streets, sponsored by the Asian American Civic Association, as you, as you guys know, on, on, um, at their building. Um, one of the biggest concerns residents expressed at that meeting, Miri Chen helped coordinate it, who's a friend of mine. Um, but one of, the, one, of the things I, one of the things I noticed is people don't know how to take their trash out. Um, it's not as simple as, as just taking the trash out and, and leaving it there, but there has to be some, there has to be a better public awareness campaign of how you physically take your trash out, when you take your trash out, what you do with the trash when you put it out, where you put it, but also communicating that in, in many languages. Most of my constituents in Chinatown speak, speak Cantonese, Ch Chinese, and um, so they have limited English, um, English access uh, to, to, um, to some of these brochures. But I guess my point is, you know, public awareness has to be an important part of, of this strategy, informing, educating people as if this is a science to doing it, because it is a science to doing it. And I think we have to get away from the old way of just throwing our bag on the street and um, expecting, expecting rats not to eat it. I think, I think we have to change the mindset of people, and we do that through education. What are we going to do in terms of educating people so we change the mindset of the science of taking out trash? This, the city has invested through the last fiscal year a lot of money in the Public Works Waste Reduction um, Division in terms of staff to address educational components. So we're building lots of educational campaigns. We're building pilot programs, as, as you were part of the Chinatown pilot pro program to look, and we're bu building educational components around that. We've been, we were funded in this fiscal year, so we're, it's just kind of getting off the, off the um, into the past right now, but for the last six months, but we are building these educational components. And I think that's why we're here today is, is we really want to be out here to educate people how important it is to containerize your trash. And that goes for both residents and, as, as you guys have alluded to, dumpsters as well, and, and people that, to close those lids, to yeah. keep those sealed, like that's another important factor too. Uh, we would uh, are working on a lot of issues in, in all neighborhoods, but Mattapan more recently about some illegal dumping issues, some dumpsters that are in real poor conditions, dumpsters that the lids were all broken and things like that. That's happening citywide, and that's that's a part of containerization as well. We have to seal off the food source for the, from these rats, and and that's we'll, we'll be focused on all kinds of those initiatives to put push those messaging out. We started we recently we've gone to a lot more community meetings. One the one in Chinatown, the one in Beacon Hill the other night, mm -hmm. trying to educate people in, out in the streets about how important it is. It's not mandatory, but it is important to keep your trash and your in food sealed so that it doesn't become a food source for rats. Thank you, Dennis, and w when you do those outreach initiatives and working with residents, and, and I know you do this um, and your team does it, but will you be sure that you include the district councilors so that they can weigh in and help you get that message out because district councilors know exactly what the issues are in their respective uh, communities. So please, please engage the district councilors. And again, I know you do that, just, mm -hmm. just as a reminder. Of course. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, Councillor, and I just want to note we've been joined by uh, Councillor Ruth C. louis -Gen, also um, one of the co-sponsors of these dockets. Um, next, we'll go to Councillor Murphy. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation, and um, thank you, Joel, for bringing up the illegal dumping. I know it doesn't just happen at BHA dumpsters, but also in open lots and empty lots around the city, but you, um, mentioned how it's disrespectful to the residents, which it obviously is, but I just um, appreciate you saying that. It's not just finding some place to leave your trash, that that 
your um, barrels and containers on those premises are for the residents. So we do have to make sure if we're using enforcement or whatever to make sure that that doesn't continue to happen. Um, and the education piece you were talking about, Dennis, is key. Um, my mother still, um, growing up, we uh, had a cookie jar next to the sink with a plastic bag, and that's where we always put the food waste. She still has the cookie jar next to the sink, and it's still just habit. We don't use the garbage disposal, but um, you know, and then you would bring out the food separately um, in the trash. But the infograms thinking we had a hearing a couple weeks ago about large venues and how are they separating their trash and talking at that hearing about myself included most people want to do the right thing when they see these barrels that have more than one hole and you're trying to figure out well is this going in a landfill where do i put it so kind of getting the education and the pictures out there and if it's a language access infograms because even when we're talking about the um textiles like what are textiles what do i consider putting in the trash or waiting for a special pickup so i think most people have questions around that and they want to do the right thing and then when it comes to trash day though and you're running out you might just put it all together and you're putting it in one barrel and so if we could just um continue that education piece which i know is a big piece but i'm happy to hear that we're going to continue that and know that we have to do more around that my question um, is, are there certain neighborhoods, I know you talked about the number of calls coming in, but do we see across the board that there's certain neighborhoods that we're getting more concerns about if it's rodents or just trash concerns that trash isn't getting picked up? Do you track um, that? I, I would say that, that the downtown neighborhoods, we, we see more activity. Um, uh, and uh, there has been an increase in uh, Brighton around commercial trash. Okay. And is there um, a need to track that more specifically to make sure that resources are going there? Or is there an overall enough for you guys to be able to not be micromanaged and you can put resources when needed? So uh, most of the work that, that we do uh, on the enforcement side is reaction to complaints. Um, we have started to map the proactive work that we do, and then that um, looking at that data, we're looking for ways to be more proactive um, with our public parks, sewers, and public ways. That's good. And one last thing. Um and I know many parks, if they're state, most kids don't know that, but we had, um, well, it was actually when your niece came in and they had asked us questions, the eighth graders from Collegiate, and two of the questions that came up was um, when they're at parks, like, is there a better way to have barrels or for them to know that there's a way for them to throw away their trash? And I know that often is a concern, especially at the state parks, because if there isn't a pickup regularly, they might not want a barrel, but then trash is always left in a spot. But I did just want to shout that out, because I know that concerned school-aged children um, would like to make sure that they're disposing the trash at these public locations. So, But thank you, Chair. That's all for now. Great. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Um, Councillor Braden? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, I've got a few questions. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, the um, the rental properties. Um, how often are in, are they inspected? Like, I you know the, the bigger buildings. The, I think the schedule is every five years. And I'm wondering, does does that inspection include refuse disposal bins, dumpsters, and the schedule for pickup? Because uh, I know when I do the walk around with our your folks uh, out in Alston Brighton, a lot of the problems we see are the big dumpsters. Some of them are, uh, if they were a, a seagoing vessel, they would sink. There's full of holes, and uh, the, the lids don't cover the bill, the dumpster. There's lots of problems. So I'm just thinking, is that is that type of a detail an attendant looking at uh, trash? Receptacles is that part of an inspection? If you were doing a, a, an inspection, 
So from my inspectors, it would be, but that would be complaint-based. Uh, I think what you are referring to is the inspection uh, for the rental program, which would be the housing division. So yeah. I can get you that information. Yeah. Uh, and do you think that would be a reasonable thing to include in a rental program inspection? It, it may be part of the, the rental inspection. Yeah. I, I am not sure. Um, what my inspectors would do is when, when there is a complaint about an overflowing dumpster or a dumpster in poor condition, we would come out, write the violation, and address that. Yeah. And then in terms of uh, when, when you put a fine on a, a for a, you have a complaint and you issue a, 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 a citation, you, you, you fine the, the owner or the, the management company, do we have any idea how much of those fines are actually just ignored and unpaid, or, or are there any consequences for bad actors? So our division, there is there's no punitive fine uh, with the environmental uh, code enforcement, which uh, Dennis oversees, um, is the punitive part. Ours is a sanitation violation that if it's not corrected, it ends up in uh, housing court eventually. They have a, an administrative hearing. If the uh, problem isn't corrected by the administrative hearing, which is um, you, you get served by a constable, you have seven days from the time you're served to correct the violation. If that doesn't happen, you're sent to an administrative hearing. Uh, by the administrative hearing, if it's not corrected, then you're forwarded to uh, housing court. Housing court. And so, how many cases do we take? Um, so it, it, it Dwindled during COVID. I don't have that the, the total number in there. It's it's usually um, five to seven per week um, that I'm seeing sent to housing court. But I don't have the total number. I yeah. would have to get back to you. And you know, I'm really wondering: are, are there any consequences to you know? It's, this is a big issue, that, and it just seems that that our landlords just continue. With impunity, and there's no there's no real serious. We we have certainly seen an improvement in in some responsible landlords in, in in reacting to some of these fines. But there are plenty of bad actor landlords that still exist in the city that they let these fines pile up, and there is little that we we, we can do about it. Right, like they, the fines have piled up and piled up and piled up, um, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. To it's it's the same bad actors that are happening across the city, it's not in any particular neighborhood, mm -hmm. but they, yeah. they certainly exist out there, and it's, and it's an issue. And, you know, I, I see that, you know, dumpsters are um, are supposed to be an ID number issued annually for a dumpster. There's a filing fee and then a, and $2 per dumpster. Like, are we trying? It seems like this is sort of the menute of, of city services like do we actually track dumpsters and make sure that dumpsters are in good shape before each year or how, how does that work um, so we we have a program uh, the site cleanliness ordinance uh, which is mainly uh, for um, commercial dumpsters um, so uh, food establishments uh, commercial businesses with dumpsters are required to have a site cleanliness license um, uh, that Dumpster will get a yearly inspection uh, on the uh, delivery of the renewal of their license. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it's not done at the residential level. At the residential level, we respond to 311 cases. We ins we send code enforcement, or we send a, a, a sanitation inspector, and we inspect the dumpster. If it's not serviceable, we work with the project man management company to have it replaced. Yeah. So it seems like the enforcement is really a weak a weak link. Like you don't really have a lot of. You don't have a lot of teeth, sorry to say. Not a personal comment, but... <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's a strong, on the front side, where you can go out and inspect and you can start the conversation, but it's the actual enforcement of it, it becomes a little bit weaker. And, and I'm also very cognizant of the fact that we're building a lot of new construction. Are we in conversation with the BPDA to think about what we can do preventatively going forward? Like, are we making sure that indoor trash rooms and... You know, like dumpsters, and, and then the other big issue is just composting for our larger buildings. Like I know this, this, the building size is is a limit. You know, we have a pilot program. Is there a plan to ramp it up to to do food composting for larger buildings? Um, as of right now, that that we don't have a program in place for that. We we've elevated the issue a few t to the BPDA, but a lot of the new buildings that we see come online trash is off often like an afterthought. 
Um, it's actually what leftover space when the building is complete, can we stick the trash in? That's not ideal. Yeah. It becomes, it becomes so a very So we need issue. to beef up that. We need to work with the BPDA to really make that. Um, I also got this information just this morning. Um, the new, new York has a, uh, and this is fun actually, New York has is a, jo a new job posting this week uh, for a director, a citywide director of road mitigation. And um, despite their, uh, this is the dream job, it's been advertised as a dream job. Uh, despite their successful public engagement strategy and cheeky social med media presence, rats are not our friends and they are enemies and we must, they must be vanquished by combined forces of our city government. Curious, voracious and prolific, New York's rats are legendary in their survival skills but they don't run the city. And they're looking for um, a, a new director of um, rodent mitigation. Um, who will be a cross-departmental de uh, uh, director, a 24-7 job requiring stamina and stagecraft, uh, somewhat, a somewhat bloodthirsty individual who's not squeamish about killing rats, operational efficiency, data collection, technology innovation, trash management, and wholesale slaughter is what they're looking for. Um, and, uh, you know, I think they are... And just at the ropes, the end of the rope, just like we are with regard to rodent control, and this is a really serious public health uh, concern. And I, I know we've had this conversation every year for the last three years that I've been here, and I really feel like it's a time to all hands on deck and see if we can what we're do, doing. You know, we're all working very hard, but it's not cracking the nut, so to speak. So uh, I really hope that we can we can. Uh, you know, come up with some more strategies, and and needs to be a multi across departmental coordinated uh, approach. The other question I had really was with just tracking. Like, I you know, is it anecdotal sort of a sense of where the calls and the complaints are coming from, or it, do we have any good, um, you know, geospatial information about where exactly the problems are, and are we thinking about using the technology that Somerville is using with the electronic electrocution boxes that are smart boxes that will actually track rodent activity and give them, they're actually able to map out where the most problems are and, and actually strategize about how they can target their inter interventions more effectively. Are we thinking about anything like that? We are. Um, that uh, company, Modern Pest, we did meet with them uh, last December. Uh, it's not a product we can buy, um, so that is a, a service that we would uh, we would contract them to do, um, and it would be a, a, a fairly large uh, contract. So we continue to have the conversation. Um, the data is is valuable. Um, most of our data comes from 311, um, and then as I said, we are starting to map our own uh, baiting. Um, in, in our mapping program uh, and hope to be able to include other data um, so that we can analyze it and be more proactive. Yeah. And do you have any idea of what the cost of that program is in Somerville, like the, the, the contract they have with their rodent? So they have two products. One is a, um, is a smart pipe that goes inside the sewer and is, is a... Um, has a heat sensor and a, it kills rats with a piston. Um, the smart boxes that you refer to, I believe the install is $300 um, and then the service is $100 a month per box. And do you have any idea how many they have, they have deployed? Um, I, I don't. When I had the initial meeting, um, they couldn't give me pricing. Um, and they had only had the city in Portland, Maine. Um, it sounds that sounds like more cities around Boston have have tried it. Um, I believe Somerville, maybe 50 boxes they're using currently. Mm -hmm. So that would be around maybe 60 or 70 thousand dollars for the first year. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sure I'm over time. I'll come back for more questions later. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Braden. Um, Councillor Coletta? Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you to my colleagues for their robust questions. Um, I do appreciate the push from my colleague to 
work with the BPDA for some of our larger buildings. Um, it, it really is an afterthought and it should not be. I have seen a lot of trash rooms um, be instituted in some of these buildings, but I think now in my conversations with the BPDA and, and with these individual developers, that'll, that'll be something that I'm flagging. So I just appreciate that and want to encourage that, that partnership. Um, I would love, before I just get into my specific questioning, just uh, more information about all of the, uh, the cases, the 301 cases related to trash and rats in my district, if I can make that request through the chair and get that information. I feel like, of course, the North End, there's just um, compounding issues with the amount of apartments and restaurants in such a dense, I think it's a quarter of a square mile, and that, of course, impacts um, our ability to keep organic food waste at a minimum. And I know that we're expanding, and that, that's one of the problems, right? I think it's trying to make sure that the rats don't have anything to eat, and it's this organic material. When you have so many restaurants, that's a problem. Um, and I do know that expanding the composting program is, is something that we're considering, and, and I think it's been very su successful moving forward. Have we talked to restaurants about how we utilize their organic materials and just making sure that they themselves are not putting their, their waste out on the sidewalk? I guess this question is for Teresa. Hi. Um, thank you for your question. Um, the state has just put out more regulations on this. So as of November 1st, any restaurant that makes more than a half ton of food waste per week will have to now divert their food waste. Um, so we're hoping through that we'll see some movement. Also, our partners at the Environment Office, the Mayor's Office of the um, Energy, Environment, and Open Space, um, are looking into providing more resources to give technical assistance to these restaurants moving forward. Okay. And a half a ton of, of food waste, that, that's a lot. So I would guess that that's, you know, it, it wouldn't capture the smaller mom and pop restaurants that are in the North End, right? So we're still going to have to maybe close that gap in, in a way and give them a little bit more assistance. Is, is that program going to help, you know, folks like... Fiore and Carmelina's in, in the North End if they don't produce half a ton of, of waste? They would not be cover, covered under the regulation. However, the state is rolling out more as time goes on. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, just in terms of enforcement, uh, my colleague got into the violations and, and what that might look like for larger landlords. Um, what is the current fine for code enforcement violation? Um, I don't have the list of fines in, in, in front of me, um, but they're different. You know, in proper storage, a trash for a resident is like $25, so it's very minimal impact. Um, they, they, for, for code enforcement, they go up um, incrementally over the first fine, second fine, third fine, but we can get you a list, an actual list of those fines. That would be great. That was yeah. my question. But, is, is Sorry, go ahead. No, uh, but but I but we do like um, we do see in certain 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 a lot of circumstances where these fines aren't impactful enough. Um, to, to change some of these behaviors of some of these bad actors, so. Yeah, and it's tiered up, right? If it's it your is. second violation, if it's your third violation. It is, yes. At what point do they get uh, put on the problem property list? Um, I think it's it's like it's after your third violation, then then we then you kind of you kind of hit that thing. But we've had a difficult time enforcing payment of these fines, right? And how we collect them. Okay. What's the the highest? Fine. It's three hundred dollars that we're allowed to to fine residents as per state law. Um, Do I have that right? Well, there's there's fines that go up as a three thousand dollars for, com for okay. commercial stores of trash and things like that. So, but residents, yes, correct. Okay. Um, do you all feel like you have um, enough staffing levels and staffing capacity to go out and address some of these issues? Like, do you feel like some of the response times are longer than they should be and, and you just need that one extra person to go out in the North End or in East Boston? We, do you need more resources for, for staff capacity, I guess is my question. Currently, um, we have good staffing. Um, we're hiring uh, two new inspectors that will get us to full capacity. Um, and um, with the additional budgeting, we're looking at uh, administrative and analyst uh, positions to better use our resources. So and that's where the trash fellow is going to be paid for, right? The, say that again. The yeah. trash fellow? Is the trash fellow is on PW. That's coming out of our budget, oh, public okay. works. Oh, okay. Excuse me. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. This was the additional money in, in the, the, the budget is we're looking at uh, analyst uh, administrative spot so we can um, 
we can better use the resources that we have. Thank you. And I do want to just put out some ideas and then you tell me absolutely not or we'll look into it or whatever, but just some of the things that um, I have heard from residents and some of the best ideas do come from the residents because they've been dealing with this for so many years. And in the North End, somebody just asked me, because they don't have enough uh, space either through a basement or a side yard or a rear yard to have these containers that you know I have in East Boston. And somebody had asked, well, why don't we just have uh, building hooks where we hook trash on the side of buildings? And then that way it's elevated and it's off of the sidewalk and rats won't get into them. And obviously we have some folks that will go through trash and I never want to criminalize that. Um, but has that been something that you know, could be considered? Could we provide hooks for, for residents? Is that something that we can look into? That's the first time I've ever heard that type of idea, so I would have to look into it further to see what that's all about. So I don't know if that would um, mitigate rats' opportunities from accessing it, but. Yeah. Rats are good climbers, um, and, and they will, um, if there is food, they will find a way. So um, okay. elevating trash would make it more difficult than sitting on the, uh, sitting on the street. Um, but it's, it's something we would think about. It may create other uh, issues. Sometimes with trash, um, dumpsters, open dumpsters, the rats don't access the, the trash, but other birds and stuff get into the trash, and then they, they drop it on the ground, and, and that creates the food source for the rodent. So. Okay. That's, that's helpful to know. Um, I, I'm happy that you brought up birds, and I, I really I bring this up just because other, again, residents have have said this to me, but I brought up the skunk uh, eco-friendly solution that happened in East Boston, or maybe have happened in East Boston, but um, I've heard of other towns um, getting owls to help and to try to, you know, I've, I've heard that owls at some point during the day or whenever they're, they're mating, they eat as many as 12 rats per day, right? And I had a, a neighbor call me and say, I saw an owl outside of my backyard. The city put this out there, that's awesome. And it's better than, than maybe a skunk, but this is just another solution that has been presented to us, and I wanted to talk through the, the likelihood of us yeah, maybe getting owls or something like that to, to put out in, in the neighborhood. So I, I have not had that conversation. There is, um, you know, over the last 20 years, there's the population of red-tailed hawks have grown, and if you go into the commons, um, I, I had a picture of my inspector treating uh, burrows with dry ice the other day, and there was a hawk sitting on the fence right on the other side, mm -hmm. waiting for a rat to, to come out. Um, so, um, I, you know, I, I don't know if, if it, would, um, it, it would be a, a solve to our problem or, or what that, but I can, I can look into it. As far as the skunks, urban legend from East Boston, I hear it. Uh, I was the inspector, rodent inspector in East Boston for a long time, uh, and you know, every day someone would say, when are you going to bring back the skunks? Um, I have looked into it and researched. I don't know who released the skunks. The challenge with, <laughs> with skunks um, is it's also part of the sanitary code yeah. um, that if you have skunks on your property, you're supposed to remove them. Um, there's also challenges around removing them, live trapping them. and um, They do uh, eat other... Uh, vermin. So, um, but there's challenges if if you have a dog and you have skunks in the backyard and you let the dog out back. Um, you know, it can it can be challenging. But uh, thinking about solutions like that, uh, anything that we can do to reduce rodent population. I think what we're talking about here, as far as trash, rodents need food, water, and shelter. But in pest control, they call it foe, and it's food over everything. Mm. And so food is the driver of the rodent activity uh, in the city, and rodent activity is based on, on human behavior. And, uh, and so we're, we are, live in a dense city, uh, and we create trash, and so that is, that is really the challenge. So if we find solutions around the food, um, we will have much more success in the, on the pest control side. Thank you. And, and just for my East Boston residents, as you've heard, the skunks are not coming back. Right. <laughs> the skunks are not coming back. If we could just add something, because you learn a lot from sitting in community meetings with John, but a lot of the residents don't realize that food comes in many sources. And I learned the other day that 
bird feed is a, a big source of rat food in the city and people didn't realize that at a community meeting we sat at the other night and people should realize that, that there are bird feeds you can buy that, that, that kind of secure them a little bit better. So that's a major source, but also dog waste. Like people were learning yeah. the other day that dog waste is a major source of rat food. So it's just, I think that's an educational thing we have to kind of, we've been working together about focusing and getting that message out there to residents, so. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and yeah, I, I just would love for us to just be creative and innovative. This is just me putting anything out there just to see if it sticks. And as you start to think about some of these solutions and you have this, this person, this trash fellow, think about how we can be better or if, if you're thinking about how we can be more proactive, um, just would love to continue partnering with you all. And, and thank you so much. And that's it for my question, Chair. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor Coletta. Um, Councillor louis -Jean? Thank you, Madam Chair, and I, I just want to thank um, everyone for being here this morning and apologize uh, for my tardiness. I was actually out in Charlestown at a, um, a, a COCO with the Councilor Hour, and, and, and the issue of um, uh, waste did come up. Um, and I also just want to, as a co-sponsor for this hearing, want to thank um, Councilor Bach for putting this forward. Um, this is, I think, the last time we were here talking about our road and control and trash issues was on my birthday on August 1st, and it was a great way uh, to bring in a birthday um, because this is an issue that a lot of residents bring up to us. It's a perennial issue that we face here as a city, and I just want to thank everyone here on this panel because it's something that my office has leaned into, and honestly, Dennis, thank you so much for all of the work that you've been doing alongside my office, whether it's in Mattapan, High Park, or Charles, Charlestown, as a citywide city councilor, we hear about this everywhere we go. And we know that the level of rodents or the level of trash pickup in a neighborhood really ties into directly how residents feel about, uh, about how much the city does or doesn't care about them. It, it's dignity affirming or dignity negating. And we have to do a lot better job of it being dignity affirming. Um, my office was out recently uh, with, with I, I think De Dennis was there, uh, Teresa, you were there, and it was actually Joel um, at a BHA property. And we know that this is an issue that BHA cares about, and we're talking about being dignity affirming. Just because you live in an income restricted unit does not mean that you should have to deal with trash issues any more or any less than anyone else in the city. And I'd also like to caution, um, it's really important, right, that we are relying on 311 and that we are relying on what people put in, but imagine you live in a neighborhood or an apartment complex where you just, you're, you've been made to believe that no one cares, and so you don't put in 311 requests because you don't think anything's gonna change, because you don't have that accessibility to City Hall. And so I think it's important for us to, yes, look at that 311 data, but also to, to try to think about reasons why we might not see the level of reporting in Mattapan or in Dorchester or in Roxbury that we should be seeing because of how people feel about how systems do and don't respond to them. And so, Dennis, you and I have been out on site with, with property managers, a lot of absentee landlords who are getting fined but aren't doing anything. We try to think about these innovative solutions about how do we add more dumpsters, how do we assure that we are getting more lids, and we, have, we, we, we get texts and emails every day from folks saying they said that they were going to work on this issue and they haven't. Um, and we know that you know the fines haven't been enough. And so we are thinking in my office about, okay, how do we mandate certain actors, um, especially commercial owners, how do we mandate them to be good actors if fines aren't enough, um, if when we're going to court it's not enough? And so I'm thinking about what are, what are some ways, you know, wh when do we actually, when are we actually able to lean in on actually using liens? And so we talked about going through the administrative process in housing court. When do we get to the point of actually being able to issue liens? Um, I, I'd have to get you some more information from our court enforcement director who, who definitely manages that process, but uh, we, can, we can provide that. But I think it's after like the third violation, then we're kind of go, going forward. But I don't think we deal with the liens ourselves in our division. They kind of move on through housing and get, and get there. But we could use some more support and help with, with, with um, setting those up. So we definitely could use that support. And so where does that currently live, the, the liens issuance? I believe it, I think it's in the housing division, you know, with the fine um, the, the liens. Um, like to, to, to turn these fines into liens. Because uh, we just, our division just, just sets forward the fines, mm -hmm. and then it goes off to right. court and, and stuff and like Right, and that, so, so our violations, when they end up in housing court, uh, eventually, if, if the court order uh, isn't, um, if it is not corrected, um, then it would go into receivership. Um, 
the the judge would order the property into receivership, uh, and then the, the receiver would would fix the issue and then charge the landlord uh, based on that property. And are we seeing? Do we see that? Is that happening? I I, I don't see that often uh, with with our cases uh, as far as rodent activity. Uh, usually, by the time it gets to the housing court, um, the the issue is addressed. They no longer. Um, the only time that we see the, the challenge is um, if sometimes the home is in probate, um, uh, issues like that. Uh, but usually if we get good ownership and they're in front of a judge, they correct the issue. And on the code enforcement side, we don't see a lot of progress in, in turning into, into liens and things like that. As you, as you know, we've gone through certain properties that have thousands and thousands of dollars yes. of outstanding fines. And so, and it's, it sort of is a smack in the face to every resident, to every person, to myself, to all of you who are out there trying to do the impossible when they ignore these fines. So we, we need to ante up somehow. And I'm trying to think about how we do that. Like, what is it, you know, is it like requiring more pickups? Is it, um, you know, requiring that they engage in, that they have some sort of alternative, right, um, to just, you know, the, the once a week pickup? Like, what is, what is going to be the right stick to use to get them to be good actors? And I know that this is not, obviously we're having a hearing here on trash containerization. If there was like a, a, a bulletproof, uh, uh, like a, a magic solution, we would, have already, um, we would have already done that. But like, you know, just in my engagement on this in the last, uh, you know, four or five months that we have been working on this, Dennis, particularly with you and everyone at Public Works, who, again, has been just really phenomenal. Um, you all don't get enough credit for how much you really do care about our neighborhoods and really do care about, our, our, uh, about this issue. But we have seen, you know, we thought we were making progress, mm -hmm. and then we take five steps back. So how do we ensure that we are, like, continually going forward? I mean, I think there's multifacets to answer a question like that and some of the things you just talked about, about multiple pickups, but I think it's, it's codifying some of these things in ordinances and making them requirements for these types of buildings that are getting away with it. We're, a lot of these buildings, these absentee landlords, they're, they're major corporations. You know, like the one we're dealing with in Mattapan, they're a major corporation. Yeah. Their home office is downtown here somewhere and, and they just don't have any grasp on their properties and things like that. So I think it's, it's kind of codifying these things in ordinances and increasing fines along these ways and maybe adding different types of fines um, to, to have enforcement, but then once you have the ability to, um, to, to, to find them, you have to have the back end to put these liens in place and, and make sure that they happen and, and that they're enforced. And um, my guess is that's probably a little, some more resources in, in housing and, and maybe even in code enforcement to, to follow through on these types of examples. So. Thank you. Well, we'll continue to work with you to, to think and strategize about this. And also, as the budget season is coming up, you know, the, any, you know, whatever you all need to, to, to make sure that we are able to respond to our residents, I know that you have my support and the support of the Seattle City Council. I, I, another question I have, um, and this directly may be directed to Joel, but I think it's to everybody. Uh, Dennis, we've seen it when we've been out, is how do we get more residents to be involved and sort of re reporting the illegal dumping that's happening? Or how do we get more residents to, to help us take ownership of this issue in terms of, of, of finding solutions? Um, thanks, Councillor. So I think, I think it's, a, it's a partnership here. I think we have talked about a couple of things, right? One is, one is right. So we're we're doing res we're we're looking at what's you know a new wave of resident facing education, and that's going to include both how to do the right thing and then how to how to report the wrong thing. That's also for us continued staff training. BHA is doing some work also just surveying our managers to understand better how this has gone for them. They do our staff do report things when they find it. Um, when there are illegal activities, you know that we we try to use a we're we are. We use a variety of sort of staff as witnesses, as well as we have, um, you know, some level of cameras um, coverage of dumpsters. So we try to try to mirror both of those. I think that, you know, ideally, like sure, residents can help, but if they, I don't think we want to put an overburden. The response, like we want to have a managerial solution that it does not place a uh, burden on the residents. But I think that as we roll out more extensive education. Um, on you know how to how to do the right thing yourself um, and how to uh, and, and better containers. I think we can also look at 
how to, you know, what's not acceptable and where to go with those various complaints, whether it's just putting it into to the city's 311 or through BHA and our um, public safety division as well, getting that yeah. over, or, or um, work order system. There's also, we talked about this a little earlier, like a BPDA potential solution to this, because as you, as you think of how you're putting out these buildings and building trash corrals or trash rooms, yeah. they have to be less accessible to the street so it's not as easy to illegally dump. Uh, and, we're in, and the specific site over in Charlestown that we, we, that we did a site tour on, the, the, all the dumps is a front face in the street. It's, it's one of the easiest places for somebody to kind of roll in. It's probably a lot of construction material. It's probably a lot of contractors that are just pulling up, throwing their materials in those dumpsters. It's because they're so street accessible, accessible. So I think there's, you know, working with the BT, BTA, as we, as we mentioned earlier, to, to, to really facilitate how trash is thought about when you're building these types of buildings is a very important piece in, in a lot of this. Um, we just recently learned, Teresa and I, about a program that the state is running. Um, it's, I, I forget the actual title, but it, it was surveillance something or other, but um, they have a team that will, will target a site and have a surveillance team looking for illegal dumping. Um, they actually came to us about a site that was having an issue um, that wasn't as much of an issue as BHA, and I've kind of started the connection to maybe connect them to the BHA to start a pilot program there, a surveillance pilot there that we can kind of um, run and see see what's happening out there. At maybe at Charlestown or wherever wherever Joel yeah. is interested in, but he said a lot of his sites would qualify. So yeah. we're gonna we're gonna we I just presented that to Joel as we as, as we got to this hearing today, and we're gonna we're gonna follow up on that. The one other thing that came to mind is just that as we're so. It's a great point in terms of we are undoubtedly have containers at our sites, and I'm sure many private landlords do too, um, and managers do too, right, which are not ideally positioned. Whether you know, and so we will work on that, right? We'll we'll get the expert advice of the city and external consultants to think about that. But the other piece of it for us is like we have to make it easy for residents to put trash or recycling, or if it's composting, in the right place, right? Mm -hmm. So not only so that it's like people know what to do. They know what to do in their own language, right? They see it or, or in a pictorial form, get that education, but also that it's it's the convenient thing to do, right? It doesn't it doesn't have to require an extra effort so much as like it's I know where to go and it's not hard, so I will do it, um, or the majority of people will. Um, and that for us, that's thinking about you know the family housing, but also senior or people with disabilities, you know, and as well as you know the work that our staff or other contractors are doing getting it there while also preventing the negative external activity. So I think we have a lot of rethinking to do in that area, um, but have some promising um, opportunities there. Yeah, and I guess I'll, I'll just close by saying I think that I think that's exactly right. In the one of the properties that we were talking about, where we met with the property manager and like, okay, we'll move the we'll move, um, we'll just move the dumpster here. And we thought it was a great idea, but we said you also have to engage community to make sure that that's the best place to move it. But I do think that and. I, I don't know what it would take for us to visit. Like, if, if we if we first start with, you know, if, if we realize that we want to approach this from an equitable uh, standpoint and, and 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 make sure that we're doing it in black and brown neighborhoods that have often been disinvested in, if we are able to tour every income restricted site and say, you know, um, this is not optimal dumpster placement. Um, and you have to have a community pro process to decide where is the best place. We have to think about the numbers of, of dumpsters you need to have, ensure that there are lids on top, and uh, lastly, the most important part, that uh, buildings and owners are not passing the cost on of these improvements to their residents in the form of rent increases. Um, and so I, you know, just, you know, I'm really glad that you're thinking about uh, this and, and, uh, with BHA and, and look forward to to continuing to work on these issues throughout all of our neighborhoods and just want to give a shout out to my own staff, Emily, uh, who has been really taking the lead on this issue in my office because um, we want to make sure that we get this right um, from Beacon Hill um, to Mattapan um, and everywhere in between. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Louis-Jen. Um, uh, now a few questions from myself. Um, one is just have we, I mean, have we thought about trying to do like a containerization pilot in specific places where we see this acute issue. So I know there was mention of the Chinatown one. I don't know, I don't, but I don't know the chapter and verse on that since it's not my district. Um, certainly, I, you know, you all are aware there are, as I mentioned, certain places in my district where because of the, the way the street grid works, um, like we're directing a whole bunch of residences to all sort of put their trash on the same corner and that, um, 
that seems like a place one might pilot a container strategy. I'm well aware that, I mean, Council of Legion just alluded to it, if you go a containerization approach, like with something that's big and fixed, then there's the question of like, is it attractive? Does it match the neighborhood? Like, how is it integrated? If some of the if the storage were underground instead of above ground, then how does that interact with everything underground? If it's above ground, you know, it, what's it in the way of? I, I know there are lots of issues, um, but I just know that as we've dug into this question, sort of attractive locked containers um, are something that folks in like New York and Barcelona have both kind of started to look into. And and I mentioned the lock because, of course, if you don't you've just been discussing, I mean, in some ways, the BHA does containerization of trash in the sense that you have a bunch of large dumpsters and then the issue becomes if, if those are accessible, if those are open, if those are unsightly, et cetera. So I, I'm aware that, you know, in city services, we're always kind of, there's always another problem around the corner, but, um, but I did wanna just ask, like, have you guys started thinking at all about this? And I recognize it wouldn't be one size fits all for the whole city, but, um, just sort of really feeling frustrated by the status quo. And I'm speaking from my office. I could I could say we think about it at least daily, if not even hourly. <laughs> like we are constantly talking about containerization and how we approve it from a, both a wrap perspective, but also a litter perspective, because that's also another problem. And we've we've had we've had some pilots over the years in public works. Uh, we had one. I don't know how long ago was it in, in the Austin neighborhood that was a partnership with Harvard. You still see some of the, the the Boston trash containers out there from that pilot in in certain neighborhoods in, in Austin. Um, that's just a leftover that Harvard paid for those bins and um, I don't know the results of the, that one it, that it just went away and it, 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 and it just never coexisted like everybody in a certain sect of Alston was given a, 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 it was a dark blue bin city labeled um, I, I, we don't have any results I don't have any results of the study I could probably try and dig back to see what happened with that we, we started some programs in both Beacon Hill and the south end with those um, um, with those like the like laundry basket the, yeah, that's what something. I wanted to call it yes, too it's, I and, was, and that's and that's basically I was one of the people in that study. and that's basically what the end result of that program became is they became great laundry baskets they weren't you know people stopped using them they weren't they were more for for less for rats because rat rats could choose those and more about litter but um it that was kind of a failed project that just didn't really work out and people didn't really take to them and didn't really like them and they did become laundry baskets all the time so um, but we, we do, we think about it, when I say hourly, I mean hourly. We're always talking about our office. We're looking, we have a couple of coordinators are in the room we're here with us now. We're always talking about, we're figuring, trying to figure out ways. There's national solutions, there's, there's global solutions of how people are thinking about this. Um, we hope that this trash fill is gonna real, take a real holistic look and figure out really what works for Boston. Mm -hmm. And it, in, 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 in Boston, it's, it could be different neighborhood approaches too, so. Right, and that's the thing is like, I, you know, I really want a solution that works for each of our neighborhoods and I'm just super aware even just the five that I represent, their trash situations are really different. Um, I, yeah, and I almost wonder, I mean, for instance, on the containerization thing, like I'm like, you know, should we, should we do a containerization pilot where we we put the containers on like a flatbed um, like little truck that we park in a parking space for a few months and then we like see does that work like you know because then we could test it somewhere else I don't know I'm just I'm trying to think about what are the because I understand for the city you know if it comes to actually like building something or putting something in permanently there's you know we really worry we want to measure twice cut once. Obviously, in my historic neighborhoods, there's a there's a sort of making sure that it matches the historic fabric aspect, et cetera. But I do kind of wonder about like temporary like test things that we could do to because I hate just talking about this issue, mm -hmm. um, uh, especially uh, I mean just the uh, you know the the I, I live on a lovely block on Pinckney Street on Beacon Hill, but the the challenges of both the sort of like trash out for almost a full day. And, um, and the rats that we're seeing are, is just kind of like out of control right now. Um, do you wanna say something? Yeah, I mean, as a result of our Chinatown litter project, we got some, some ideas for some community-based bins. There, there are still challenges with those because um, then illegal dumping becomes much, much bigger issues because of these residential bins. Are they commercial bins? If you know, if you have a residential bin out there that's accessible to all, then all the commercial ends up in there, and then now you're hauling away commercial for the for the local businesses. So there are a lot of challenges we're working through, but we are starting to get these ideas, and we're starting to think about how we pilot and test these ideas. Um, and we're hoping that this tra trash fill is going to kind of bring us to that next level um, of what ideas we start implementing. Yeah, and, and really, you know, I feel like, you know, with our trash contract, the frustration isn't just exactly the details of it, but it's also that I think we've sort of felt like 
because we really just have one big, I don't even know if you guys, did you get two bids? In, in we, we have five bids? separate contractors, but one contractor won all five bids. They were, it was two companies that bid on them, correct? Right. So, cause, cause I do also wonder about like breaking things up and whether smaller contracts that sort of are more customized for our neighborhoods would help us get solutions. That so it's, for it's probably goal number one of the trash fellow okay. to, to reestablish new contracts that make sense for all of our neighborhoods. Um, so I guess, um, what about like tightening up this window? Like one of the things I've heard is, so we've talked, I talk, mentioned at the start, the idea of starting later, like, you know, having it be trash out at eight instead of at six. Um, part of me really wonders, I mean, at what, like in my ideal world, trash pickup would be late enough in the morning that we could reasonably tell everyone they have to put it out in the morning and we would take away the evening before option. Like I, I sort of feel like there's, there's no getting there from here as long as there's an option to leave trash on the ground for 10 hours in my neighborhoods in flimsy plastic bags. Like it just feels like we can nibble around the edges literally of that problem. But, um, so, so part of me, and, and I know that there's something, this is a state sanitary code question as well. I know there's something in the code about, you know, trash needs to be only out on the day that it's picked up. I think we have historically maybe interpreted that as a city as a 24 hour period instead of a schedule, a, a calendar day, but like it would definitely be better in my neighborhoods from a sanitary perspective if, if it was a calendar day because rats are nocturnal. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, you know, and obviously pulling that period in would need to mean precision um, by our trucks of when they could pick stuff up. Um, and, and, and of course it would need to be such that people could drop their stuff before heading out for work for the day, like I, and, and at a time when people would be awake and such. But I'm just curious if we've thought about really tightening up that window. So yes, um, again, this is another kind of project of the trash fellow, but um, the way the contracts have been written for the last 20, 30 years, it's been basically based upon efficiency, but mostly cost efficiency. So the way the tra trash contracts work is often um, when, you, when you have a district, the trash company will roll into one district in the morning and then have to get into the other, the the, the other district in the afternoon. So if you shift to those times later in the morning, you start shifting the, 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 the second shift of the trash later and later into the neighborhoods of eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night and picking up off the street there. So I think it's a, it's a holistic approach of how we have to rethink our trash contracts, but we'd have to rethink them um, less from a perspective of cost and more from a perspective of service, if that makes any sense, because they've been strictly driven by efficiency of cost over the last, I say 20 years, but it's probably been done like this for 30 years, 40 years. Right, right. And I think certainly what you're hearing from the council is, is that what we care about is the outcome for residents. And so the cost efficiency, it's not really cost efficient if it's not buying what we want, which is Correct. clean streets, right? Um, and so, yeah, I just, and I also think that the need for there to be kind of one size fits all has sort of felt strange to me. Like, like you know, the fact that we know that we've got neighborhoods that are on sort of that morning shift and that afternoon shift, but we're telling them all, put your trash out starting at 5 p.m. And, and I really want to stress, I know that that's not our recommendation in the sense that we, of course, tell people, like, you, you know, put your trash out in the morning if you can. But I think it's important to stress, and I think this has come up a lot in the last few years vis-a-vis -vis public health recommendations, is that, like, people kind of think if they can do something, it's fine. Like... That's, that's sort of like, if we're saying it would be nice if you put it out in the morning, but you can put it out at five, what people hear is it's fine to put it out at five. Um, and so like, I just, I just really, and I also don't think there's a lot of value to having a one size fits all policy because although I recognize with communication strategies often, like it's like we want to be able to print up the same ad and like put them on the sides of all the bins or whatever, like, I just feel like um, with the folks who we find are, are hard to reach with the right information, we're going to need a neighbor-based, a neighborhood-based communication strategy anyways. And we already know this, like we have different trash pickup days for different neighborhoods, so we've already abandoned like a true one-size-fits-all policy. So it just feels to me like we could tell people like your neighborhood like gets picked up in this window, you need to have it out you know, by then. And then also if somebody came back and said, well, you guys have put the earliest time like half an hour after all the students or workers of this neighborhood leave and like that doesn't work, then we could fix that too. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't know. Um, there, there are definitely a lot more efficiencies that can be realized by writing better trash contracts. 
across the city. And 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 then like playing with kind of temporary containerization pilots mm -hmm. is one of the things we can do in the interim, right? While we're waiting right. for the 18 months. Um, and obviously the council, you know, the council's been proud to support that trash fellow, to support the additional positions in ISD. I think the idea of you guys spending some of that on analytics is great because like I don't have any doubt that everyone in ISD is working hard on this. So it's like we have to work smarter, not harder, because I think like in terms of the amount of effort everybody's putting in, like it's you know, we're we're topping out there, but we're not we're not where we want to be. Um, I just wanted to flag one thing for composting. Um, one thing I definitely have heard in um, in my neighborhoods that don't have space for containers is that even that container that Councillor Flynn thinks is perfect is maybe a little big. And so I do wonder as we scale up, and then also there's a, I mean, I know you guys are gonna have to think about bigger buildings above seven units anyways. I strongly believe the new ones we should be just requiring to build great trash and composting facilities and, and I'm happy to chase that with BPDA. Um, but for the old existing ones, we have lots of like, you know, big existing apartment buildings in my district. Um, like, I don't know, thinking about is there, you know, I know it's annoying for us to potentially have multiple types of composting containers, but that like pale size that some of the private contractors have, it like with this, these tiny apartments, it does seem to work better. Is there a way we could have pails and then maybe there's for a bigger building, something that everybody puts their pail into? I don't know, but just, I wanted to flag that those containers are small, but on narrow streets and in small apartments, they're like, and especially if you get a bunch of them out on the street, like they kind of block the sidewalk. So I just wanted to. Um, our vendor presented to us a, a solution today for that, for presenting buying smaller pills that we just got, I think yesterday, uh, today actually, we got the, the so we, we just started to look at it this morning. So we are gonna look at those options. And okay. it is a pail, a pail like option, like those pail sizes you see it with some of the other companies that service the city. Okay, yeah, no, that would be that would be great. That was something I just wanted to put. Um, one thing, and I'd love to work um, with Councillor Lou Jen on this. My understanding on chasing this liens issue is that code enforcement tickets used to be turning into liens on properties, and then basically the law department said that code enforcement wasn't documenting it in a way that they could like sustain when the owners challenged the liens. And so law basically put the kibosh on it, not because we can't do it, but under the theory of like, if we're going to do it, it has to be better documented because obviously it's not good for the city to just keep losing in court to property owners over these liens. So, but it seems to me like we've left it there as so they're not gonna roll up into liens. Um, and I think it is resulting in a lot of our big property owners just factoring in tickets and assuming a certain write down after they negotiate with code enforcement, mm -hmm. like in as like kind of their cost of doing business and, and their cost of doing business has this enormous negative externality for the residents of the city. So I do think we need to kind of, and this might be a like pushing on law for like what, what do we actually need to feel like we're gonna have the, the paper trail back up for like going back to a lean based you know, approach. Cause um, I think the stuff on, on the housing side for ISD, when it ends up in court, that can be effective, but that's not really this stuff. Like most of that are those like, you know, right. housing standards orders that are coming through around, you know, somebody's like key bathroom appliances are broken or whatever, right? Like that type of thing. Um, so would love to help put pressure on that. Um, and, uh, um, I guess one question, one more question for me would just be like, well, I guess, and then I'll have one for Joel, but dog waste, like, okay, so it's a big source for rats. We persist in having problems with, um, with folks, you know, leaving it uncollected. We obviously need to have really strong public campaigns saying you've, you've got to pick up after your dog. Like if you cannot pick up your dog's waste, you are not qualified to own a dog. Like this is like, this is like basic and like you can't, you know, it's just, it's a key part of pet ownership. Um, but I know that we've gone back and forth on like, you know, are there opportunities to have sort of like dog, dog waste, um, like places for the people to throw it away. I think the city's been generally resistant to that kind of thing, but I also don't know that people are sort of supposed to be putting it in the, um, in the regular trash containers, et cetera, at our parks. So I, I don't know, John, if there's, since you have the parks and stuff, but I mean, it's all, it's also all over the neighborhoods. Like what are, whether there's an official city, like policy on dog waste and whether we're thinking at all about, about like more innovative strategies there too. 
Uh, well, we do do outreach and education around it. Um, uh, as far as uh, dog waste not being allowed to be thrown in regular trash barrels, I'm not sure about that. I, I, so that's what I was going to ask. Is yeah, it fine? I, 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 don't, I don't believe there's an issue uh, in, in regular trash in a, in a park to uh, dispose of dog waste. And what about in our, um, I guess, like, and what about in our residential trash? We, yeah, dog waste. We don't. We, we take dog waste in the right. residential trash. We do find it in the recycling bins, which we reject. The recycling right. bins for contaminated bins, but not in trash. We allow it's, it's fine right. in, our, in our trash right. stream. Um, and and is there a reason why we don't? Why we haven't sort of pursued the idea of having like little dog waste receptacles? So that would be a, a question that has to ask of our highway division that deals with like you know street baskets and things like that. If, like what they're pursuing, they would have to get back to you on okay, what yeah. their strategy yeah. from there. Yeah, I would just love, because it has, you know, there are, I think we all know, like, in various neighborhoods, sort of, like, places where we see it intensively, um, and, you know, and maybe part of the solution is, you know, if that's a park, just making it clear that, like, maybe, you know, some little sign, like, remember to throw away dog waste, but, like, on the trash cans, people know, like, you can do it here or whatever, um, but, yeah, no, in Beacon Hill, I mean, if you leave one of those blue recycling, open recycling bins out, like, people leave dog waste there and it's very frustrating again it's a key part of dog ownership that we would like everyone to just understand um and then i, I guess uh joel can you just um like are you are you thinking how how basically um i guess i i heard you about, oh, we're trying to innovate in this space, but I don't think I quite understand exactly what it would look like in practice or whether there are sites at the BHA where you feel like you already have what we want and sites where we're trying to get there. Like, do we have sites, for instance, where things are much more secured perimeter-wise or? I, I would say that, um, you know, we, like, the things that come to our attention the most is, is unfortunately, on the negative side, right? It's because people call if there's a complaint, right? So. The larger family properties, properties with more dumpsters, perhaps more dumpsters that are sited, you know, in two conspicuous areas, right? Like, is a problem. The flips. So, on the one hand, you could say it's working better at smaller properties or elderly properties or the sites that have traditional residential pickup. But I think that's sort of missing the intent of your question. I think um, there probably is some distinction, but there are there are also variations between sites like. There's differences between Charlestown and Maryland McCormick because of the layout of the streets and what trash bins you can fit there. As a, whereas otherwise, you know, if we if you give an equal space, we would, we would have a different scenario. Um, so to try to get at your question, um, I mean, I think it we are going to really look holistically, and the holistic look will include what is the um, and, and keep in mind, this is in a time period, so timing this for 2023, where it would inform public works efforts and thinking about mm -hmm. what, how is this interactive with the city's future contracting plans, um, where we are partnered in that. Um, I think it's, these are the, so we have, you know, we look at our, our properties, um, family, elderly, um, and, you know, understand these are the current dumpsters, layouts, et cetera. And these are the other bins that are not on a um, city pickup contract, but are on a, a different BHA procured private contract. And how is that currently suiting our needs? As well as, given the space in an additional in a, in a residential unit, what space do people need within, and what would residents actually use to better, let's say, recycle? Right? Do they need a specific size bin that's uniform for BHA properties, or for elderly properties, or for? properties that were built around this, I don't like that where they're, that'll fit well. Also with composting, if we introduce that, no, and virtually no one right, has a composting bin in, uh, in interior to their unit, right, uh, before they take it outside. Like what's the size of container that a resident wants, needs, could use in, in a general room layout or on a wet bedroom and a two bedroom, like does, does that fit well in the current structure or, do, or is, it, is it some alternative solution, right? So. I think those are some of the things. There's also just questions in terms of like, with food waste, we've been talking a lot with um, Teresa and, and Dennis and others in terms of like, do we need things for some kinds of trash or recycling or compost, right? Particularly on the food waste side that is more, um, you opt into it, but it's maybe there's a code or something. So it's, it's not, um, 
you know, the people who want to, to want to use that service in this case would, um, you know, uh, choose to do so, but it would also be more more sealed off because of the way that that could otherwise contamination would be a problem and pests would be a problem. So I really think it's all across the board. Um, I think part of the research in that regard is like, here's the various sizes of containers of difference. So what if, you know, it's like we're like, what's the what's well, how many yards dumpsters and how many are at this site, right? And how many other containers are there? And what is the frequency and uh, pickups and what's the total tonnage right related to that so like that's that's the kind of analysis that's going on in order to get in like what do we need inside what do we need outside and where do we need it and what contracts need to be in place either from the BHA or the city side to make that a um, more efficient better and more secure system got it yeah, yeah. No, I, that. I also think it's important just to add to, to what we're saying is that we our partnership has been solidified but we we're about to put out an RFP um, for a consultant uh, as a partnership between us and the BHA that's going to look holistically at all these BHA issues. So Teresa's done a lot of work on the RFP and what that will, will address, um, but that's ready to go, um, should be out in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And obviously, like a ton of Bostonians live in BHA properties, so that's great. Yeah, no, all I was thinking was just that because every BHA property is different, we might actually have some lessons incidentally in places where it's working and maybe it's just because they're small or they're you know they have a different like setup they have a trash room in the basement of a senior building that doesn't help you figure out how to handle a large family site but i'm just curious whether within the diversity of our setups right we might have some that seem to be working better i think we i think we do i think you're right um i, I may have not given that enough sort of of a response, and I think I think the yeah, answer is fine. probably that I don't know, but we're surveying our staff and our residents for that reason. So, like, and sometimes trying to judge whether the answer we get back is like, is it indicating the problem or the solution? So, if someone, if it's like, what would you like? What would you think? What do you think would be most effective? Sometimes it's a really great, like, yeah, we just need to make that change. It's moving the dumpster, and the manager knows exactly where it should go. If it's like we need an increased frequency of pickup, but the pickup is three times a week. Um, and it's set by contract. Then we have to think about okay, like what's what's at the root of that issue? Is it actually pickup frequency, or is it something else mm -hmm. that we need to do? So I think we're we're trying to dig on, you know, <laughs> listening listening for what are the what are the yeah what's the feedback we can just take and implement, and what's the things that are like okay, we need to actually think about what is behind that. Got it. And, and I guess the parallel question on the city side would be: Do we have a sense of an estimate of like standard? household trash like do we have a sense of how like amounts do we have a sense of how that varies per neighborhood um like you know just from a sense of designing containers i mean obviously we can do something like the pilot and then people say well we need something smaller around here and that's a that we're learning by doing um but i'm just curious sort of what are, what the level of our data about trash yeah, generation I mean, we collect data is. um by neighborhoods in terms of total tonnage um, we've never broke it down by household to this point but that's probably something that we could do just based upon total ton tonnage in neighborhoods and but we do track it we do monitor where the tonnage is coming from with a where we we, we monitor with the diversion rate what's being diverted to recycling programs and food mm -hmm. waste programs so we're tracking all that by neighborhood now but not broken down to the household level yet but it's probably something we could do and should do and I know that the you know the mayor's office of housing kind of has that data about how many like household units we have like how many housing units we have in different places so it might just be a good thing to mm -hmm. get it get some sense and and also I, I know that we haven't really to date been talking about anything where like at the household or more likely like building level where we're asked we'd be asking people to like compact or condense like their trash but it it does seem like at least at the larger building level like that might be something at some point it's i mean it's done in very small amount of buildings where they have com compactors versus actual dumpsters i think it's very small percentage that actually do compaction mm -hmm. so there's no requirement or anything like that um okay i am mindful we have a lot of great people who are waiting to do public testimony um so i i want to go to them shortly so i'm just going to check whether my colleagues um councillor brady and councillor legion have have a second round of questions and then want to go to them yeah, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm kind of oh, can, one second, one second, Councillor Braden. I think Councillor Legion has to leave, so if you yeah. wanted to just okay. do you mind? Just, that's fine. No, you go ahead. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Just a very quick question. Oh, just I don't believe in antidotes as being the way that we make decisions, but my mother is in love with the residential composting, and I just cannot, I cannot believe how it's right next to the trash bin. She uses it religiously, and my mother is a stubborn woman, and so I just think that there are, I think it's a perfect size. I think it's going really 
you know, great from the people I know who are using it. So I just want to fangirl on that a moment and just want to say that I think that's a really great size and it could be a really great model for, for um, us when we're thinking about implementing it citywide. I just had a question about dry ice because you mentioned it, uh, Dennis. Last year when we had, we were talking about the difficulties of the city procuring dry ice. Are we back to a place where we have enough dry ice where it's, it's actually more part of the solution now? That's actually more of a John question. Oh, sorry, it was John. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, it was John. Uh, so there was a su supply chain issue um, in the last two months. Um, it seems to be solved. Um, so right now we're getting uh, about 240 pounds uh, a week um, to use in the box. So over the last three weeks, it's probably a little more than 500 pounds of, of dry ice. And how, in terms of translating that to like efficacy and percentage, like how, like what is that getting us in terms of? Um, so it takes about two pounds of, of dry ice for each borough, um, depending on, right now, mainly using it in the Boston Common and public gardens. Okay. So effective, uh, we also have the borough RX machines, which use the carbon monoxide and we're working on the logistics around getting tanked uh, carbon dioxide, which, you know, instead of dry ice, we could get delivery of tanks. It's, it removes the complications, but that's in the works. Okay, great. glad to hear that dry ice is back on the table and that hopefully we'll be, be able to get into more neighborhoods. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Madam so Chair, much. and thank you, Councilor Braden. Thank you, Councilor louis Um Councilor Braden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, so much of this is, is driven by statutes and city charter and ordinances, but the other, we also have the capacity to write new rules and regulations in, in light of changing conditions. Uh, are, are, head, are heads of department using that capacity to write new rules? You know, especially, um, I'm thinking about you know, the whole issue around new construction, and sometimes city services, some city services, not all, come to the conversation late in the day while the project is sort of in the final stages of approval and it's very hard to change the direction and certainly the developers are not very happy to see us weighing in on closed up trash rooms and how are you going to dispose of your trash. So I'm just thinking um, our, our, that's a conversation we maybe need to have with the BPDA but are, are you folks thinking about you know new rules with regard to on-site trash disposal for new construction or any of those questions um, we, and exercising that power we, we, that you have we have certainly thought about it but we haven't we don't have anybody focused on policy in, in that that would kind of drive that as of right now like we we haven't had those deep conversations with BPDA we certainly we certainly react to what we see in the streets and what we what, you know how we handle it. Um, I know the environment department t tackles a little bit from a commercial trash level, like that's commercial trash is, is their kind of expertise, and they, they kind of handle it from that level uh, commercially, and uh, they may they, they may deal with it in some of the bigger buildings. I don't know, but um, but we haven't actually tackled it other than given it a lot of deep thought recently about how we how we can um, start to change behavior inside the city to be more efficient trash wise. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think, Dennis, uh, we should set up a conversation after this to really go into some of the more the nitty gritty of all of this, especially the problems with regard to enforcement and, um, and then the documentation. The fact that we can't have a, a reliable paper trail that allows us to enforce our regulations is a big problem. Uh, one question that we had with ISD last year with regard to thinking about all of this was that the, a lot of the um, documentation was sort of a pencil and paper exercise. Do we, are, do we have a digital way to, you know, like mobile uh, uh, iPads or whatever to do on-site inspections and record violations in, and, and then get it into the system that, better than just the paper? That we no, were using it, a few. it is in the works. It's something that uh, I, I believe uh, other divisions are starting. Our division does not at this time, but it, it is in the works. Uh, the analytics and finance yeah. team is, is working on that. Yeah, because so, you know, as a council, I think I think Councillor Bach would agree with us that we really want to support you in every way you can, so that you'll be really effective in, in enforcing the rules that are on the books, so we can hold bad actors accountable and actually improve the situation for our residents across the city. So anything, I look forward to further conversation. I think this is just the start of it. And, um, and I'm also going to explore, you know, the whole idea, figure out in the whole whatever's happening in Somerville to see if we could maybe think about a pilot program over 
like the BIN program that was done 12 years ago, uh, to see if there's any potential to do some sort of a pilot program with some of this more smart, this new, new technology that we could implement in a in a local area just to get some metrics of how effective it is and if it's if it's worth doing on a bigger scale. But I, I'd love to have the conversation. Great, we we would too. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor Braden. Um, yeah, lots of follow-up. I'm excited about the trash fellow, excited about the rat analytics, but really like, you know, I, I really would like to pull this time period in in the new co trash contract. Um, but in the meantime, I just feel like we got to do everything we can on the containerization and experimental front. So like, let's find a few places to try you know, central bins, let's think, uh, great to hear you guys have maybe a smaller solution on some of the composting. I actually think, interestingly, I was thinking, Joel, that some of the analysis you guys do, some of the constraints of space that BHA public housing has, sort of in terms of unit by unit, um, are actually similar for the sort of tight, old, pre-war apartment buildings um, that are in some of the parts of the city I represent. So it'd be, it would be interesting to share that those findings after you guys have the consultant back with us um, just in general, and city can learn from the thing. Um, but I can't just like, can't stress enough how, uh, how I think kind of like, just um, how bad the problem's gotten in parts of the city and the sense that like, we really like, we can't, we can't wait 18 months. So anything that we can attempt together um, I think really, really uh, we need to be doing. Um, and to that end, I do want to give um, members of the public a chance. So uh, if you guys had anything you wanted to say in closing, great. Other, I obviously would appreciate it if the departments would stay to listen to the public testimony. Um, Dennis, did you want to say anything? No, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing the, the public's testimony. No. John, all set. Okay. Thank you. All right, so then I'm going to call up. I've got here in person um, Alexandra Criven, um, Diana Coldren, um, and Michelle Roloff. So those three will be first. Um, I don't think Tucker is here to testify, but if you do want to testify, let me know. Um, and then um, I've got a bunch of people on Zoom as well, so I want to go first. And so you can use either of these microphones here, just stand at the microphone um, and just make sure to kind of speak into it because even though we can hear you if you don't in the room, the people who watch the hearing on Zoom don't, don't get what you say if you aren't kind of talking into it. Sure. So, um, Lexi, you have the floor. Sure. Hi, my name is Alexandra Crevon. I represent 425, 427 Marlborough Street in Back Bay. And um, we're chatting about residential um, trash and the issue we have in our block. And thank you for prioritizing this. Um, this has been going on for a few years in our block and we really would love to come up with a solution. I did submit written testimony um, to the councillors. Um, I didn't print them out. I didn't want to create waste. So I apologize for that. Um, we see the current issues as not just rats, but also trash pickers, wind, and uneducated residents. So there's a few parts to this. Um, our block is willing to work with the city and to pay for my suggested um, trash containments that we have thought about their size and their placement um, in the alleys and how they'd be locked and that they'd be accessible for both residents and for the city and with specific signage so that each building knows where to put their trash. Um, we are and are we are requesting that trash be removed from Marlboro Street. Um, it's the only block on Marlboro or on Back Bay that has trash out there. Well, that was instituted about five or six years ago with the old trash czar, and it just isn't working due to the issues with trash collection, the timing, and it being left out on the street all day. Um, we're looking for city approval for our pilot program, and we'd love to work with the um, city for trash collection and collaborate with enforcement. That was a huge part of what we did about five or six years, years ago with the enforcement going through our alleys every day and ticketing. That sort of stopped. Um, so feel free to use me as a resource and also to use our block as a pilot. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much. Um, and I, I'm very excited about that prospect, so hope that we can work together on that front. Um, Diana Coldren, our um, Beacon Hill Citizens Extraordinaire. It's <laughs> quite an introduction. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair, and fellow um, neighbors, and everyone who's working on this issue. I really appreciate it. 
My name is Diana Coldren. I've been a resident of Beacon Hill for 22 years. My family and I moved here from Philadelphia in 2000. Ever since 2009, I've been involved with basically everything from recycling to trash. I was on the Beacon Hill Civic Association, and the Green Committee was very active in implementing an extra recycling day. And Susan Casino with the city helped us with that, so that was fun to work with her. Um, I appreciate you holding this hearing. I believe that the rodent issue is probably number one quality of life issue right now in the city and definitely in Beacon Hill. Looking at the 311 calls, it's very interesting um, to hear the numbers because I think that's concrete data that we can look at and hopefully work towards a lower number of rodent activity calls. Um, just looking at it briefly right now, over the last 14 days, there have been 300 and six calls citywide that's open and closed. So that would equate to almost 8,000 calls in a year. Um, what I notice, what I think for 311, I'm encouraging all my neighbors to report activity, even just sightings, because I think often people see rats and they just don't report it. And it's important to report it because obviously if there's a rat, there's a burrow nearby and food. Um, Recently, a review article came out, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. It was um, referenced in the Boston Globe, but it was um, a March 2022 review article in the Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution by Michael Lee and several co-authors. They reviewed over 4,000 municipal um, studies and ways that municipalities have addressed rats. And it's no surprise that out of the, all those uh, review of publications, they came up with um, that municip oh, excuse me, municipalities must employ a regular, ongoing, and comprehensive um, basis uh, fo fo sorry, focusing on the food. That was the most effective. Lethal uh, concentration on lethal methods was not as effective. So I think you alluded to that. So given that, um, I'm here to advocate for the same day trash pickup, which our neighborhood has actively advocated for for at least as long as I've lived here. And I think that that will really cause um, an effective reduction, maybe a, even acceptable <laughs> amount of rats in the area. Uh, right now, what we're seeing is that the trash will sit out. So even though several of us on our block put it out at uh, 5.30 in the morning, it may sit there really until 4 or 5 in the afternoon. Um, some suggestions that I have as a resident is that um, I noticed that recycling and trash lingers on Charles Street, which is our main shopping street and really a go-to destination for tourists. So I would recommend that that would be picked up first. We have tourists coming into shops uh, making comments like, is this, is, this, is this common on a Friday afternoon that your, your trash is sitting out all day? So we're getting comments like that to the shop owners. Um, I think education is key, and I think that, you know, in Beacon Hill, the average age of our residents are in their young, like, early 30s, and so there's constant transition. So I think that whatever type of education um, articles, that needs to be constantly, like, every quarter, call 311 and address the situation that way. Um, I think that in terms of setting a goal is really important. And I know it's hard because as more people call 311, those numbers are gonna go up. But that might be a way to start. Like, what do we want? What's acceptable for rat sightings? We're not gonna get rid of it 100%, but we can certainly reduce the rats in our um, area, in our, in our housing area and outside on the streets. Um, so I guess, I think the only other thing I wanted to mention, because a lot of it has been mentioned, um, is that other, other types of control. There is a, uh, I don't know if this has ever been tried here, but a birth control <laughs> method, contrapest, I don't know how expensive it is, it, it might be quite costly, but Washington DC has been utilizing this and the company itself has reported that in their studies there's been a huge rat reduction when they employ this special food that actually causes rats not to be able to have babies. Um, so I wonder if that's something we can also look at. And I also appreciate, I know in the past we worked with a gentleman named Pedro. I don't know if he's still um, working with the city, but it was really nice to have a connection with one person in our neighborhood. And I think that that might be helpful so people really feel that there's someone working on their side. Um, I know in Beacon Hill, recently there's been some instances where there's rats on private property. 
and that the city has, you know, suggested that those uh, residents hire their own private pest control companies. Perhaps there's a situation where they could sign a waiver, like in Somerville, and that the city folks could help residents actually find the solution, find the issue on their property and solve it. So those are just some ideas, but thank you for all for addressing it. I really appreciate it. And I especially want to appreciate, I want to, I want to say thank you to uh, Kennedy in uh, Councilor Bach's office and Jacob Warner because they answer all my emails and questions. So, and thank you, Councilor Bach. Thank you so, uh, so much, Diana, yes. And I echo your thanks to Jake and Kennedy who are awesome. Um, next up is Michelle Roloff. Hi, I'm Michelle Roloff. I'm totally nervous to speak in front of you. So thank you for um, the excellent presentation today. I've been here since 11. Um, I wrote you a memo because I thought it would make it easier for you to understand my issue. But I'm here to try to just um, personalize it. So I lived in Back Bay. I've lived in South End. I've lived in the city since 1995, you know, when I was a student. And I lived in Beacon Hill, and I had this super cute little backyard, really small, like about as big as this little area here the three of you are sitting in. But enough that I had this tiny garden, a tree, and I would sit out there, and I had my kids, and that's why I loved staying in the city. All my friends left and went to the burbs, and I stayed in the city, even though the parking's a nightmare and traffic's a nightmare. I wanted to have, like, city kids. So imagine my dismay in the last three months when this backyard that I used to have like a kiddie pool and my flowers and sit outside and have you know cupcakes and a drink of wine in the evening or breakfast with the kids is totally, completely overrun with rats. There was a tree this size. You saw it in the back of the memo I wrote you about this size. Of course I called the city to ask for help from 311. But that little backyard in Beacon Hill is not accessible by the city because it's you know closed in between Myrtle Street and Pinckney Street. I have spent $20,000 and honestly, probably five or six hours of my life since August, trying to, every week, trying to work with contractors to try to get rid of these rats. It's honestly like terrible, like scary, like they're running all around in the daytime and the night. So I'm trying to say, here I am, a person that has time. I have the money to spend on it. I'm from Beacon Hill. I'm trying to like figure it out myself. You know, I used to be an engineer and a consultant. I am sitting there saying, what if this happened to somebody else? What if somebody else's backyard that didn't have the kind of influence that I would have to try to solve this? It's frightening and shocking. So that's why I wrote the memo. I put a few pictures on the back. I would have loved it if the city was like, oh, hey, Michelle, yeah, sure, we'll work with you. Just even just give me ideas. I've been through three pest control guys. I had Hartney Graymont crane the tree that they were living in over Pinckney Street. I put that on my Instagram if you ever want to see them pulling that tree. But that whole entire tree that had been there for 100 years was being used, eventually figured out in the last couple of years, as a rat den. They just went down to the tree, and now the whole tree root system is where they are. So there's holes all over my yard, the next door neighbors, two neighbors down. Everybody's got rats, and it's right near the state house. So I am simply saying I have spent money, time, my intellect, my networking, and I'm not very far. So I would love to work with somebody from your organization to be like a pilot and you guys can take all the credit and, and just make the rats go away in those three areas. And uh, you know, people in Beacon Hill will contribute. Our neighborhood, we um, clean the streets before the street cleaner comes, right? We charge everybody on the block like 150 bucks. We've been doing it for years. So we always have like a little kitty. So we clean the streets before, then you clean them and it ends up looking pretty good on Pinckney Street. But these rats we're making like no progress on. Thank you. Thank you so so much, Michelle. And I, and I think I think the point that you make in your memo that you know not only is this a really difficult thing for a for a resident to take on financially in terms of time and in terms of just like learning about it right from jump, like even knowing that it. I mean, I will I will say before this, I didn't know that rats could take over a tree's root system as a burrow. So that's a terrible new fact that I know now. Um, but. But I think, you know, in addition to that, as you point out, right, even when we pour a ton of resources in, if all that you're doing is displacing the rats to the next block over, you know, at some point they'll end up in some public ways and then they become this, the city's problem in this official sense, but really it's our collective problem the whole time. 
Um, so I think like anything, anything that we can do uh, to coordinate better with that on the jump and the city can lead on, um, it feels very important to me. Um, uh, are you? I signed up over there, but oh, great! Right. Yes, if you want to, um, one second. I'll just ask Ron. Do you mind going and getting the? It, you're you're not Tucker, are you? Austin. Austin. Okay. Um, I yeah, yeah. Just, just, yeah. Give me one second. Sure. Formally, he'll go get me the your name, okay. and then I'll call it out. But you can come get come down and get ready. Right, thank you. <laughs> um, and then, and then, like I said, I'm going to go to the folks on Zoom because we've got some folks waiting patiently there. Thank you so much. All right, um, Austin King uh, from Back Bay. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I'm Austin King and I'm in your district, councilman, uh, councilor, and uh, I just wanna say that I, uh, I've called 311 multiple times and you guys have been super responsive, so I appreciate that. I know Jake Warner had come out um, personally and taken my call and came out at like 9.30 on a trash night specifically to, uh, to kind of see the scenario. So I live on, um, Fairfield and Marlboro, but the only access to my apartment is through the public alley, and that's where all the trash is. So you have to go through the like sort of tunnel of trash to get there, and you know they hear the footsteps, and then 15, 20 rats come out, and you have to walk through that um, every trash night. So you know not only a public safety concern, but just disgusting. Um, and uh, you know I'm, you know. Guys, my girlfriend's gonna try and move in with me in, uh, in next next year, and, on, and it's impossible to sell the rats. It's like uh, we're gonna have to move out of the city, as uh, some as uh, the President Flynn was talking about. So, um, just wanted to mention that. Um, so, we've tried. I've contacted my landlord. We've worked on our personal backyard. We've cemented in like the areas around our specific backyard. Um, We've put, hired a rat guy to come and put traps out and get their food. Nothing works. The rats will still chew through those wooden fences that go in between each of the backyards there. And, um, you know, it's, it's not even a building by building issue. It's like, you know, a whole neighborhood issue. So, you know, people try and just do it for their specific building when it's not really affecting the whole issue. It's just putting a band aid on it. So, just want to point out that people are doing that. And, on trash nights, you know, we'll see people who are allowed to put their trash out at 6 p.m. the night before um, doing it. And I've actually, you know, confronted one of these people. I'm like, hey, like, I know we urge you to uh, put them out the next night because there's rats. But uh, he actually um, cussed me out after that and told me to mind my own business and said, let the rats run around themselves. And um, so, you know, we can educate people, but there will be these bad actors who don't care about it at all and will do whatever, you know, just whatever suits their uh, lifestyle. So um, there, we are dealing with these people, and I know at the, the end of my street there's an Airbnb as well, which I know I don't think is allowed, but um, they are the people who also, uh, you know, just drop trash wherever because they don't live here, and, uh, you know, it does not any concern to them. Um, additionally, um, there's no room for trash cans, really, on my block. There's, like, the, me the cylindrical poles that prevent cars from crashing into the building if they make a bad turn. Um, so, you know, it's probably about like a foot and a half like space on the ground back there and then there's, you know, a bunch of parking spots. So you're either going to have to commandeer a parking spot for a trash can or, um, you know, move those cylindrical columns. So I don't know how um, you plan to do that, but I appreciate you guys um, continually being creative and trying to come up with an innovative solution um, that this requires. So. I do have some ideas, no need to address them now, but just uh, general things that, you know, we've already addressed some of these during the meeting, but um, building upwards, I love that idea um, that one of the counselors said over there, um, if there's like hooks or anything that you can place a, um, a trash can on that, um, you know, rats can't chew through. I know they chew through plastic, they chew through pretty much anything that's not concrete or um, metal. So if there was something there that could people could just kind of lift up and put in, I think that would be super helpful. Um, I know I've I've thought of the idea of poisoning trash, and I've called you know several people, but then you hit non-target animals is the main concern there. Um, you know I don't know if there's some type of food that wouldn't be harmful to like a dog or um, any non-target animal that would kill rats, but I think that is potentially worth looking into. Um, I like this, the innovative solution of sending out 
animals naturally, like the owls or the, definitely not skunks, but maybe cats <laughs> um, or something like that. Um, you know, just innovative like that. Um, and instead of negatively reinforcing a lot of the punishment, so if someone is a bad actor and, you know, punishing them, what about positive reinforcement, like a tax cut or something, um, you know, if people are doing the right thing, then, you know, incentivizing them to do that through, you know, one way or another and um, giving a tax break. Um, what about trash pickups in the middle of the night? Um, and then lastly, 100%, I think the, the solution is to work on the, um, the contracts with the garbage, um, the garbage collectors, because you know, if you just have them come out right in the morning um, and just have either more garbage pickup trucks or anything like that, um, I think that would be way more effective than having, you know, we have in our alley just open bags just lining the entry to the alley. And there's like a, you know, you can see holes in the trash bags where they go all the way through from one end to the other. Um, so any, uh, obviously the, the less time the trash is out there, the better. So just want to echo that point. Uh, appreciate um, you hearing, hearing me out on this. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Austin. Um, and we would love for your girlfriend to become a Back Bay resident. So um, I'll work on that. And I do think, you know, I just, I want to stress for department folks here that to me, it feels like, you know, especially when we talk about sort of pilots and experimenting with things, you know, working with our places where we have a block, you know, where folks just recognize what we're doing right now is not working, and there's kind of that openness to experimentation and trying things out. I think often, you know, as a city, we don't want to impose on people something that's a new way of doing it, especially if we're not doing it for the whole city all at once. But, I, you know, I, I really hope that we can kind of move forward with some partnerships with the folks who are reaching out saying, hey, try something here because what we have is not working. Um, I want to go to the um, folks I've got in the Zoom room. And I've, just, I've got a list. I don't know exactly who's here, so I'm going to call them out. And then um, Ethan or whoever's managing, if you can just. So if Nancy Cerventi is there. And if not, or after Nancy, if she is, then it would be Parker James. Um, and but um, so okay, the people I have are Nancy Cerventi, Parker James, Conrad Armstrong, Dr. Valerie Smith, and Carolyn Reeves. So if any of them are here, oh, there we go. There's Nancy. Excellent. <laughs> Hi, Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Sorry. You know, my tech skills, I think I was in the wrong room or something. <laughs> and I, I, I don't want to belabor things because a lot of people have covered everything and you hit everything. Thank you so much for doing this and everybody else who's involved. Um, just a couple of things that crossed my mind. One of the things you said at the very beginning about um, coordinating uh, within um, the, the area, I think um, that would be really huge. I just participated in the hearing on the restaurants and the plan to have more restaurants. So, so putting aside how I feel about that, um, it, 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 nobody was concerned. Nobody was talking about trash until different people who were online started talking about the problem that has come from that with respect to um, trash, um, et cetera. You know, with, with the, like six months out of the year, basically no street cleaning and the commercial trash. So you've hit on that um, and I'm glad that you did. And I would suggest that there must be a way to maybe have different areas of the city uh, government who are doing these different components um, would be able to get together um, so they would know about it because they really was, they seemed surprised by the fact that that was an issue. Um, and um, I, I think with respect to the contract, uh, I don't know what it says, but does it really have to wait for a year and a half if they're not doing any of the things that at least were promised were going to be done. Maybe those were just the promises uh, from the city folks and not from who, who were pushing the last contract and not from the contractors themselves. But um, if they can be here early some mornings and not others, could there be ways that that could be at least um, made more consistent and not have to wait for a year and a half uh, uh, to, or, you know, at least maybe have some pilots around certain neighborhoods that are near all the restaurants and the trash, et cetera, to see if the uh, people would be willing to put their trash out in the morning and then coordinate that with the pickup if at all possible. 
Um, I don't know if that is, but if it would be, it would be terrific. And also any kind of digging or contracting um, that's going on, if we could have that, that would be terrific um, uh, to have some baiting because we've been kind of just informally checking with people who've been on Charles Street for like weeks now and they look at you like they have no idea what we're talking about, like whether they baited when they do the digging and the construction. So I think I think the commercial trash and the, the construction work really needs to be brought into the picture much more than it is in terms of how much garbage sits out there and when it gets picked up, uh, et cetera. And thank you very much for addressing this because it's really so important. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, yeah, and I think Nancy brings up the really good point. She, she lives on the flat of the hill and we have a lot of areas in my district where residents and commercial life is so close together that really like they're a totally intertwined issue. Um, so yeah, definitely would love to us to chase some of those suggestions. Um, Con uh, Parker James, if Parker's on, and then otherwise go to Conrad Armstrong and then Dr. Valerie Smith. There's Parker, great. Uh, hi, um, <clears throat> thank you um, all very much uh, for taking this issue seriously. Um, I know that you, Councillor Bach, of all people understand uh, the complexities of the situation, particularly in dense neighborhoods like ours. Um, there are uh, Lexi Creven, my next door neighbor, Conrad Armstrong and Carolyn Reeves are all going to have given testimony by the end of today. Um, I'm going to just simply say that I support the idea of a pilot program or multiple pilot programs uh, for the neighborhood. Uh, this is an ongoing problem. Um, there are complex causes and I think there might not be one single solution. We might have to try multiple things. Uh, regarding the rat population, one thing that I'd like to point out to you all is that um, Marie and Dan Adams of Landing Studio got a commission in Chelsea um, to develop um, a pilot project of um, feral cat houses. Um, and the, what they've come up with is um, they're insulated, um, they are up on stilts, um, and they are, uh, they have like flap doors. Uh, they keep the wind out. Uh, the cats are doing great. And um, the neighbors, uh, the, the rat, cats originally inhabited a junkyard and the neighbors did not want, when the junkyard was removed, the neighbors did not want to lose the feral cats because the feral cats did a great job of dealing with the rodents. So, uh, I know it sounds crazy, but that is one possibility. And if you want to look at the cat houses, uh, they're on the Landing Studio website. Um, so that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for taking this seriously. And um, we at 421, 423 Marlborough Street will participate, will support, and open our checkbooks to whatever the solution is. So thank you. Thank you so much, Parker. Um, all right, going next to Conrad, then I've got Valerie, Caroline, and I've also got um, Harvey Fisher, and, um, and I'll just double check with staff for anybody else who's on the Zoom. Um, but if Conrad is here, take him next. Hello? Hello. Hello, there you are. Uh, my name's Conrad Armstrong, I'm at 439 Marble Street, and I've lived here for 23 years. Uh, I'd like to thank the council for recognizing that this is a, not just a big problem, but a multi-dimensional, multi-departmental meeting. Um, a couple of things I want to say, I'll keep it under three minutes. Uh, in Back Bay, and I'm sure other dense neighborhoods, there's some buildings that have trash pickup through the alley, but the building goes right up to the property line at the edge of the public sidewalk part of the alley. Businesses in these kind of buildings can use those hard plastic rollable bins and are apparently allowed to leave the bins on the alley sidewalk 24 seven because they have such frequent trash pickup by private vendors. Based on my inquiries to ISD, uh, apparently residents are not allowed to do that. I'm sure there's some reasons behind that logic, but I think the city needs to make exceptions for certain situations where a residential building that has trash pickup in the alley and has no rear yard and no interior common space for bin storage can use or even be forced to use rollable hard bins that are essentially left on the public alley sidewalk at all times. Just like the rollable bins that are used by businesses in the alleys between Boylston and Newbury streets, 
bins would be temporary, so could be moved for fire or snow emergency or utility work. This would allow large residential building to put their trash out without bags spilling into the alley where they're run over by cars and broken apart and would actually make it easier for the trash collectors because fewer bins is easier to collect than tons of half open strewn about thin garbage bags. Also, trash in my alley is sometimes picked up at 6 a.m. but sometimes as late as 6 p.m., which happened again this past Monday, which caused a disaster because one large residential building puts the trash out at 5 p.m. the night before. Assuming the route and schedule of garbage trucks is known, how about having a system where people could voluntarily sign up for automated text messages, telling them roughly when their particular street or alley will be picked up that day? This would certainly require coordination and integration with trash collection companies, but we need to think outside the box for innovation, innovative solutions. Obviously, not everyone has the flexibility to put the trash out at flexible times, but people who live full-time at home or work from home might actually want to wait till one hour before their particular trash is picked up because they then will know that it'll reduce the likelihood that their own trash will be broken apart by rats or birds or bottle collectors. Thank you for letting me speak. Great, thank you so much, Conrad, um, and strongly agree it would be great for us to be able to get those updates. And I know we've talked about trash truck tracking and opportunities there, um, but I agree with all those comments. Um, all right, Dr. Valerie Smith, then Carolyn Reeves, then Harvey Fisher, and again, I'm just gonna check for anyone else. Um, Valerie, if she's here. Okay, uh, we'll go next, it sounds like, to Carolyn Reeves. There we go. Carolyn? Oh, yes, I'm sorry about my, my video there. Um, I want to first say thank you to Public Works and the ISD teams, uh, with a special shout out to Gerard Gorman and to our city councilors, um, whose personal dedication uh, to the city is really impressive. I'm thinking of Councilor Flynn running after a Ill illegal dumper, which is quite remarkable. Um, I also want to mention John Stelberger, who started EHS and the use of dry ice in rat control, because he is a personal hero. I, I just think he's phenomenal. Um, so Councillor Flynn started off, us off talking about the impact of rats on families. My two sons learned to count by looking out our window in the back alley and counting rats. One, two, three, four, five. You know, and now my son is a senior in college majoring in math. So I, I do have to thank the, uh, the rats for something. Um, but we've got a new problem, which is that we used to have our rats contained in the back alley. Now, with our trash having been moved about maybe three to five years ago, as Lexi Crevon mentioned, moved out onto Marlborough Street, the rats have just moved from our back alley, where they were more or less contained, into the front. They've undermined front gardens. They've taken out planters. Uh, we've had walkways collapsing. And we really need to try to concentrate the trash uh, in our back alleys because at least then our properties are protected from this unholy mess. Uh, 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 avocado peels on the street, etc. Um, I just want to say, hearing today, it's just exciting because you guys think and you work. But here are some of the technological solutions I think I'm thinking of and we've been thinking on. As you'll see, it's a lot of people from our, our block um, thinking about these solutions. Staggered timing pickups for neighborhoods enhanced with new technologies, as Conrad Armstrong suggested. Smartly sized containers that can be used in tight situations, like in our back alley, as Conrad Armstrong suggested, on the sidewalks uh, that haven't been available to us, for example. Smart locks on those containers, only accessible to the city workers and to those who are supposed to put their, their garbage in those containers. Nanny cams, real or faux, we, we, don't, we don't need real ones really, but to let bad actors know that we are watching. Uh, and maybe city subsidies, but it's, innovations, perhaps under the beautification grants. And then finally, as Parker James so generously mentioned, 
public-private partnerships that are working so well in other parts of the city um, that, that where private individuals can pitch in to citywide solutions or city solutions in their neighborhoods to try to innovate and to try to move the process forward. I'm not sure I'm all for cat houses in our neighborhood. I think we just got rid of ours. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I think that there are solutions uh, with the new technologies. And really, we've got a fabulous team. Again, thank you all so much over the 30 years that we've been working together on this, uh, on our block that I know of. Um, and I think we really can make a difference now. Great. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, thanks, as ever, for being with us and all you do. Um, I've got up next uh, Harvey, I think, under Eduardo Fisher, and then Bob Oppenheim. So if we can pull up Eduardo Fisher, Harvey, that'd be great. And then right now it's just those two. Um, and so if you are looking to testify, you should sign up quickly, um, or else we'll always take written testimony to the committee, ccc.csit at boston.gov. Um, but I see I've got uh, Mr. Fisher on the line. Harvey, can you, are you able to hear us? I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can. Yes, I can hear you. Do you have a video or no? I don't have video. Do you want to try turning it on? I did turn it on, but I don't know why it's not in here. I see you guys perfectly. Uh, let's see. Start video. Oh, there we are. Great. Okay. Um, my name is Hef Fisher, and um, unfortunately, I'm at my home in Mexico right now. But um, the um, I live at 461 Commonwealth Avenue, corner of uh, Commonwealth and Charles Gate West. As Kenzie is thoroughly aware, we've been working on the issue of somehow uh, getting the trash under control on Charles Gate West. Uh, it, is, it is absolutely a nightmare over there. We're not going to go into that at this meeting. It's not the agenda. But I do want to make some suggestions of things that came up today. Um, <clears throat> one of the things is that fines are just not sufficient. They're a $25 repeat fine is ridiculous. And we have a large number of buildings that dump onto Charles, Charles Gate West, actually 13 buildings. Um, and like, I'd say probably 75% of the buildings are rentals, are apartment rentals with a very large student population. And they don't care about the fines. Uh, what the issue, I know the city has tried to go after some of the res residential buildings on Beacon Street because the problem is so horrendous on that street. Um, I think with the apartment buildings especially, if, it, it's up to the landlord to be coming down on people in their buildings who are illegally dumping, which they are doing all the time. The fine should be es escalated very heavily on the landlord owners if their residents are constantly in malfeasance on this matter. Uh, that may help these apartment buildings to really start taking this matter seriously. Uh, the other thing is that we have a rat problem. Yes, we definitely have that. Um, as a matter of fact, my building has spent over $20,000 in the last 15 years for rat eradication in our front yard, basically, not our backyard as much, but front yard, uh, spending over, what was it, 1400 this summer just for uh, extermination of the, the holes that open because we're right next to the trash area. Uh, but one of the things they could do is that the bigger problem for us, I hate to say it, is the homeless population that Charles Gate West receives so much trash disposal, not from all those buildings, but from illegal dumping all the time. And I've sent you videos. We have, I had a Mercedes right before I left pull up with her SUV, obviously a suburban woman, and she dumped all her bags onto Charles Gate West. It avoids her having to pay for uh, going to a city dump in wherever she lived, Bedford, Lexington, whatever, when she comes to work. We run into that all the time. I've sent you actual videos of confrontation with truck drivers at 6.30 in the morning filled with trash. And they told me, well, they were told that all the trash they pick up up on Bay State Road is supposed to go on Charles Gate West. I mean, it is really a terrible situation. But with the homeless population, it'd be okay if the bags, because most people responsibly dispose as are required in plastic bags closed up 
Uh, we do have a real problem with paper bags. I don't know where that's coming from, which tend to be tipped over and thrown all over. But the homeless people, and I've sent you sh video and Josh, uh, Josh Warren, who's fabulous, your assistant, like he's been really helpful. I've sent you videos, I've sent you photographs of the, because I have cameras on it, of these guys, and they come through in armies four or five times a night in the middle of the night. My cameras pick them up. They rip the bags open. They're not just being polite about it. They rip them open, not necessarily looking for bottles. They're looking for bounty of some sort, uh, discarded appliances, whatever they can take. And they dump the trash on the sidewalk. And it's become a major personal hassle for me because I'm known as the trash man of Charles Gate West. Um, I had someone accost me at Star Market this summer um, over in, in the Fenway, two, two homeless guys said, hey, you're the trash guy over in Charles Gate, aren't you? I said, yeah, I suppose so. And um, they thanked me. They thanked me. They said, yeah, at least you're out there with your brooms and with your buckets and your trash barrels filling one to two trash barrels on average every Tuesday, especially from all the crap that's all over the sidewalks. This has been documented on Channel 4, or Channel 10, I mean, WBZ did a whole uh, thing on that. I'm sure you saw it. Uh, there's a documentary crew that's talking about featuring a film on this starting when I get back into May. It's an untenable situation. And I don't think it's as much a rat issue for us as no enforcement anymore like they used to be. And I've lived in Boston downtown 50 years now, uh, Beacon Hill, South End, and now Back Bay West. Um, there's no sense of urgency to control these people from doing what they're doing. And they don't care. They truly don't care. You can talk to them and they just look at you, give you the finger. I've had a knife pulled on me. I've had an ice, a, 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 what do you call it? A, one of those cutter, paper cutters pulled on me to mind my own business. It is a very bad situation for us over there. And the one little, couple of other comments, the geese. Uh, the geese, I've actually took photographs. The geese are actually going to the bags now. They come over in Armada from Charles Gate Park, which unfortunately now is the Mecca for hundreds of geese that have all fled the Fenway because they can't get into the area there anymore because of the fencing and everything while they're doing the work. And the geese poop is everywhere, everywhere. And I know dogs are hugely attracted to it. I'd be very surprised if geese are not too. We have to get that cold, just like they culled on the Esplanade. It is way out of control. And as I said, they're crawling all over the, the bags now, uh, looking for food items in the trash bags now. So we have that added problem. But I appreciate your trying to rectify this, but we need to, at some point, we need to focus on Charles Gate West. It is a very bad, embarrassing situation for the city of Boston. And as our trash guy said to me, who well, we've had for a number of years now, he said he and the guys think Charles Gate West, other than Upper Mass Ave toward Melania Cass, he said it is the worst trash situation they face, face every time they come in. And they thank me again for going out at 6.30 in the morning and filling my own trash barrels with the stuff all over the sidewalk, sweeping it up so we don't have to deal with it when they come through. Um, but anyway, thank you very much. I hope we can come up with some viable solutions. But this thing of all those buildings dumping on Charles Gate West is untenable. It has never worked. It's never going to work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Het. Um, last, I've got Bob Oppenheim. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great. Anyway, I, I really actually don't have much to add at this point because there, there's, there's, and I want to thank everybody for, for having this discussion. It's been really excellent. And I think that um, a lot of the people that spoke have covered the points that I would have wanted to make. And um, Lexi, Caroline, Conrad, and just how added, added some dimension to it from the other side of Charles Gate. I'm also um, a resident of uh, Marlboro in the same block, but across the street um, uh, um, uh, from uh, the other, the other um, from Lexi, Caroline, and Conrad. And I, I want to say that um, that uh, there is some history to the changes in neighborhoods, and I think the whole idea of one one way of looking at this 
that fits all isn't, um, it, it, it may not be the best. And uh, it, it was many years ago, not three or four, that the shift to Marlboro Street um, garbage, it's a unique situation with Alley 905 um, having had a huge rat problem, and there was always a rat problem on the other side of the street. Um, there's always been rats on the street, um, at, at whether or not the garbage was in the back or the front. In fact, I think the rat population now is less than when I moved in in 1994. But that's not the point. I think the point is, is that what's always consistently said, and I said you said that, Kenzie, yourself, that we, if you don't feed the rats, you're not going to you're going to lower the population. And I think the fact that trash is allowed overnight is one of the most significant problems and and the easiest probably to fix. I don't know what the contract situation actually is and what'll be permitted with those changes, but I think that's the most, that's the first and easiest thing to fix in neighborhoods where there's an issue. And Conrad brought up the the um, what restaurants use, um, the trash receptacles that um, can be attached to the um, disposal trucks. And, uh, and it's true, if residents could have that in areas where there is no alley access, and that's one of the critical problems on, um, on the side opposite from the I'm 440, the odd, side of the street, part of that alley, the end of the alley does not have um, access from the buildings uh, to uh, um, an area where they could, you know, dispose of trash in a, in a, in a very good way. It, it gets cluttered with trash, cars run over it, and, and during the snow, it's, it's just horrendous. And, and rats do, do feed there. But I think, I think the easiest thing, the easiest first step would be to think about um, scheduling in areas that don't allow for the feeding of rats, investigating alternative ways of um, storing trash. Although some buildings just don't have the ability to take a, a one, even one of these large barrels. The building I'm in, 440, doesn't. It would have to be in the front hall, and um, which would be pretty hard a uh, hard thing to do. So um, anyway, I want to thank everybody for uh, um, uh, listening to us and, uh, and 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 for all the ideas that were expressed. I think I think I think that there there are a lot of possibilities for improving this, and that's the optimistic part. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob, um, and thanks to everybody who's testified. I'm going to just very quickly read into the record um, some thoughts from Stephen Jeffries, who was here but had to leave. Um, member of the public just wanted to say he just wanted to say that composting, though compelling in its own right, will not solve the rat problem as they go for any food source, including non-compostable items. Um, and he also notes that at 10,000 households per year, it will take the city 27 plus years to service all our households. Um, although I would say that we are planning to ramp it up faster than that. And one of the things the council's invested in is sort of some of um, that back end capacity to manage um, composting as we scale up. Um, he just notes that uh, you know, um, from his perspective, when he thinks about the property taxes he pays the city, a major priority would be anything that we could do to hire more pest control service contracts and help everyone on this front. Um, and then he just makes the comment, I think, you know, we've talked about it again and again, everybody says that at my property where I have sufficient space to have trash barrels, I have never had a trash, my trash invaded either by a rodent or a human looking for returnable bottles, but my apartment dwelling neighbors are not so fortunate. Um, it's his opinion that the city made the rat population exponentially worse when they moved the trash collection so early to 6 a.m. since people started putting out all of their trash the night before. Um, he notes he thinks it's a technical violation of state law to put your trash out before midnight. That was that definition of a day thing I raised earlier. But nobody's going to stay up till midnight just to put out their trash. That's certainly true. Um, and uh, in any case, trash pickup in our neighborhood increasingly is not occurring until the afternoon, meaning that the rat buffet has existed for 18 or more hours at that point. Um, so he just says anything you all can do to help us would be much appreciated as this is the worst I've seen this problem in my 60 years as a resident of 12 Brimmer Street. 
Um, so just wanted to get that on the record for Stephen. Um, and uh, all that remains is for me to just really sincerely thank um, Dennis and John and Teresa uh, for all of your work um, day in and day out, and also for staying with us um, for this whole hearing and listening to all the residents' concerns. I, I really appreciate it. Um, and so, and uh, Councillor Braden, did you want to say any, any final words before I gavel us out? I just want to say thank you. Thank you for all the great work. I know we have a lot more to do, and I think if we all work together and work inter interdepartmentally, I think we can come up with some, some solutions. I think my little, yeah, I look forward to the work ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, yes. And please think of the Council as a partner in this. We do not have the technical expertise, um, but we, yeah, I think, I think this Council is very willing to bring resources to bear, bring political pressure to bear, help connect when it comes to the public communications with our neighborhoods, you know, help connect you guys with those. I think, like, um, you know, it's the, the single thing when both Councillor Flynn introduced his pest control um, hearing order and I introduced this containerization one. I think they were the ones that the most councillors stood up and talked about. We all, these are the, the real most grounded issues of the city that we deal with and we want to help our constituents have better quality of life on this front. So thank you so much. And um, with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.